if I lost it all today, what I would do from day one to day 180 to rebuild a six-figure residual income. Written and read by Joe Wagner. I want to dedicate this book to my wife, pal, who without her never-ending support and faith in me and this industry, this book would not be written. This business has been a partnership. Without you, this would not be possible. I love you and thank you. I'm so glad that you've decided to listen to the audio version of this book, and I highly encourage you to also read the physical copy as well. Through the audio version, I will get off word for word what is written in the book, though I will try to stick to the script as much as possible. I think this is really important because I want you to understand the context. I want you to understand where I'm coming from, as this is a book not only about how to succeed in merchant services, but it's, a, it's the lessons of my life. It is stories of things that I've experienced and how I came to learn the lessons that I share in this book. So from here to the end of the book, I'm going to wing it, though I'm going to follow it as much as I can. But by winging it, I hope that you get a grasp of my passion for this business. I truly believe it is the greatest vehicle that exists in America. If you're going to sell a product, you might as well sell something that will create a residual income so that one day you can own your life, which means time freedom and money freedom. This vehicle will absolutely create financial freedom. If you can go out there and get results, it is nothing more than a math equation, which I'm going to talk about a lot in this book. The math equation is simply getting results multiplied by time. Okay, that is a huge concept of this industry. It's actually everything in this industry. If you can get results, multiply it by time, you are going to own your life. That is something I am very passionate about. I'm actually obsessed with helping other people own their life because when I first saw this vehicle, I knew it would create that for me and my future family, which I now have. The vision became a reality and yours will too if you stick to this business. Let's get into this book. I'd like to make it very clear that I love this business and that I intend for you to own your life through it as well if you're willing to put in the hard work. Let's get started. Introduction. There are two categories of people who are going to read this book. Those that are experienced in the payment processing business and those who are brand new or considering getting into it. Whichever you are, I guarantee there's plenty for you both in this book. It is my goal for any type of person listening to this, by the time you finish, to have a clearer vision of what you're actually involved in here, how to maximize it, and prepare you for some of the battles along the way. My specialty is selling the cash discount program. I'm not an analytical person, except for with math, which is going to be one of the main topics of this book. I could really care less about discussing all the technical aspects and terminals and how all the technology works. That's, that's really not my gig. I'm not analytical and I won't be going into details beyond getting results in this business and why it is absolutely critical for your future to have success selling it. I care about helping you. I care about helping others achieve financial freedom through what I know is the greatest industry in America. It also doesn't hurt that we get to go out there and help businesses put thousands of dollars back in their pocket. So if I can help you become financially free, that actually means that we're helping thousands of business owners put more money back in their pocket at the same time. Just another reason why this is the greatest business in America, it's all revolved around helping people. My goal is for you to understand via math and my real life examples that there is no other business like this. I also want to put it out there that throughout the book, I am going to invite you to join my company, Easy Pay. However, if you don't, I will still offer you free coaching and training. I hope that's all right with you. Let me be clear. I'm writing this book because I know if I can help enough other people get what they want, so will I. This book is not for average people. There's nothing average about me. There's nothing average about my outlook on this business. There's nothing average about how I feel about my obligation and duties to succeed for my family, for my community, and for me to contribute to the world. Average is not a part of my world, nor do I want it to be. Average never did much for the world anyways. 
It's the obsessed, the energetic, and the dreamers that grow in life and contribute towards an advancing world. People like Thomas Edison, Paul Allen, Elon Musk, the Wright brothers, America's founding fathers, and endless other examples didn't leave their impact on the world by being average. These were extraordinary men. They were creative, and they were obsessed with making an impact and pursuing their passions. Now, your goals like mine may not be to compete with Elon Musk and to be on a level to change the world like that. However, I believe everyone should be obsessed with changing their world and their family's opportunities within it. Payment processing will do that. This book is for those out there that are in the pursuit. You may not even know what you're pursuing yet, but you can feel it inside of you. Something is calling your name to become great and build a great life to your liking. Why shouldn't you? After all, you're the one that's living in your life. You might as well love it. This book is intended for those who have a deep longing and passion for finding their life purpose. The standards that society puts on us through the social norms, through the school system, and average thinking does not interest you. Something inside of you knows deep down a long life of mediocrity, limited abilities, and asking for permission from others is unacceptable. This book is for those who are not meant to be average. Welcome to the club. There is nothing wrong with you. I remember the feeling of knowing there is more to life. I wanted to be more. I wanted to do more. I wanted to give more. I wanted to live free. And yet I had zero direction or guidance as to what that actually looked like or how to accomplish it. But as with all things in life, if you keep moving forward with passion and purpose, the path will reveal itself. Have faith and a spark will illuminate from within you. If this book lights that spark or if it dumps gasoline on an existing flame, you will not want to ignore that feeling any longer. The purpose of this book is to ignite that light in you or dump gasoline if it already exists. If you are the right person at the right place in life with the right book in your hand, I hope after reading this book, you become obsessed as well. That's right. I want you to become obsessed with this business. You see, average people think obsessed is a bad word. We're not supposed to be obsessed. That's too much. That's too overwhelming. Get in line and be quiet is what they tell us. Why should we allow average to dictate this burning flame from within us? See, I'm obsessed with owning my life in all areas, and that includes time freedom, money freedom, and health. I wrote this book for anyone out there that wants to own their life too, but might not know where to start or you're looking for an extra nudge. The truth is, I've been there. I've done that, and I know the feeling. The tools, lessons, and guidance within this book will encourage you to seek out accomplishments in this business with the right mindset so that you can unlock what is inside of you already. In this book, I'm going to share some of my stories because that's how I learned the lessons. The examples I share are not right or wrong. They're not true or false. If you disagree with them, it's okay to disregard them because they're not meant to be boasting. They are simply my story. And I'm sharing them with you because they are how I learned the lessons over the last decade and became a professional of selling merchant services, specifically the cash discount program. It is my opinion that the payment processing industry is the greatest vehicle that exists. You're going to hear me say this over and over again. And I wrote this book because I want to show you why I know this to be true. Within this industry is a true freedom that does not require you to pick up the phone answer an email or to have to keep up with renewals and making sure that your customers and portfolio resubscribe at any point. That doesn't happen in this business. Once they are your customer, if serviced correctly and they never leave, the money will just keep coming. I've talked with hundreds of people from other industries that technically kind of make a residual, but it's all based around their customers have to re-sign up. They have to re-subscribe. They have to resell them. They have to re-get a signature. They have to repay for something. Okay, that's just a bunch of really, 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 really hot leads and customers that will probably just buy something from you again next year. But that's not residual income. Residual income is the work is done. The money keeps coming. Game over. I don't have to answer my phone or check my email. That 
is what this industry is. When done right, you will be able to step away for periods of time, whether that's short or long or forever, and the money just gets deposited into your bank account with zero effort. How would that change your life? What would you do for that result? Hopefully, the answer is whatever it takes. So here's the bottom line. With over a decade of experience in this industry, I've witnessed payment processing create freedom for every individual who is dedicated to long-term growth and can get results. And I mean every single person. Not 50%, not 80%, not 90%. 100% of the people that can get results and dedicate themselves to this for long-term growth are financially free. That doesn't mean they're free of problems. It means they have more money coming in than their bills and lifestyle cost. It's a guarantee. It's not my opinion. If you could decide how you could spend your time, your working hours, and your day, what would you do? How would you live your life if all financial ends were met automatically each month, regardless whether you went to work or went to the beach? The truth is, I bet you would just become the best version of yourself possible. Many people say money simply puts a spotlight on you and magnifies who you already are. Simply put, if you are naturally a giving person and become even more financially abundant, you'll just most likely become more giving. If you are genuinely a happy person who becomes financially free, chances are your positivity will shine even brighter. You will simply become more of what you already are. My wish for all of those who complete this book and take the leap of faith towards financial freedom is also continuing to leave the world better than the way that you found it. Take every nugget of information gained from this book and lead by example. Teach others who are willing and looking to grow why the biggest hindrance between the life they have and the life that they want is simply average thinking. And though the focus of this book is on selling and building a cash discount empire, I do hope the lessons are applied to many other aspects of your life as well. See, champions have similar mindset. It's not about the industry only. It is about a champion mindset because with a champion mindset, there's nothing in this world you will not accomplish. With that being said, let's leave average thinking behind us and begin how I would create a six-figure residual income within 180 days. Chapter one, all in or nothing at all. The first time I saw merchant services, I knew I was going to do whatever was necessary to succeed in this business. Again, I understood the equation right out of the get go. It was predetermined that this would be the way in which I would own my life. But before I can explain all that, I want to tell my backstory in order for you to better understand my history and where my life goals came from. Growing up with an entrepreneurial mother who owned a sign shop, I was destined to be an entrepreneur too. Mom taught work ethic by example, not by talking. She was a true example of doing whatever it takes. I have nothing but admiration and respect for people that are willing to work to the bone to make ends meet for their family, and that's what my mom did. In Seattle, I was selling Mariners and Seahawks signs to my classmates in elementary school. As a teen transitioning into adulthood, I would spend my summers going door to door asking businesses that had, you know, beat up signs if I could touch them up or simply replace them or update their existing signage. I'd make the sale, fix or replace the signs, I'd put a little bit of money in my pocket and I'd have some spending money for a while so I could get back to floating the rivers. I didn't know it then, but I was learning door to door sales and how to make a living. My summers were literally spent floating the rivers, jumping off bridges and rope swings, having a great time while I would do odd jobs on the side in between for my spending money. It was great. I was in control and in the driver's seat of my life and of my summers. I later would work a couple of bar back positions at a couple nice steakhouse, had some server positions, bartending jobs, did that stuff for a couple of years. I'm sure a lot of you can relate. I've always been involved with people and service type industries. By having a free spirit, I also always knew that there was more to life. Can you relate to that? With a nomad spirit, I decided to move from Seattle to Southern California at 21 years old. From there, it did not take long to meet someone who would absolutely change my life and was a key player in the direction of it. 
His name was Curtis. In California, I was working nonstop. At one point, I was working five Denny's graveyard shifts. I did five Outback dinner shifts, and I also worked at a little Italian restaurant three or four lunches a week. I mean, imagine that. I'm getting off the dinner shift to go to the graveyard shift at Denny's, and when I'd get off that, it'd be early in the morning, and the restaurant would be getting open and starting to prep for lunch. There were points in the week I was sleepwalking. I mean, I was sneaking one and two hour naps in the back of a truck that I didn't even own. I was borrowing from a friend. There were days I would get off from one job, rest for a couple hours in my truck, and I was straight back to the next shift. Talk about the rat race, right? And although I was consistently and constantly working, I was still broke. Meanwhile, Curtis was living it up at the beach soaking it up in the sun as he bought and sold Craigslist items. I was working my bones off and he would just buy and sell things like boats and jet skis on Craigslist and play with them in between the sales. He was living a great life and I was in the rat race. I had a lot of admiration for that. So when Curtis later introduced me to a multi-level marketing company, I checked it out. He was new to the business and hadn't made it big with the company by any means. However, he invited me to a presentation and I accepted the invitation. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. This company had a product that was to travel, literally. They had travel club memberships for insanely discounted prices and they would go to luxury resorts with other travel enthusiasts. That was it, that was the product. And the more people we got to come travel with us and join the travel club, the more monthly residual income we would make. Yes, making money while traveling. Now, it is hard for me in an audiobook to put into words the life-changing paradigm shift that this moment had on me. It just made sense. Since that moment, my vision and goal for life has stayed the same. My goal in life to this moment while I record this is still the same as that evening as a 21-year-old kid who just discovered that it is possible to own your life, to not stress about money, to travel with your loved ones, and to make a residual income. This was the moment I learned what residual income was, and I was blown away that everyone in the world was not pursuing it. Needless to say, I signed up. I didn't just sign up. I was all in, baby. I quit all my jobs and Curtis and I focused 100% on the business. We quickly realized not everyone had free thinking souls like us. We couldn't figure out why everyone did not share the same excitement as we did. Why didn't they have the same enlightening experience? It was as if people actually wanted to continue to simply work for a paycheck their whole life by choice. To this day, this is a concept my mind can't comprehend. It makes no sense if you know better and find a vehicle that allows you to not have to do that. I don't get it. In the end, we did grow a downline of individuals, but we never fully succeeded to create financial freedom in this business. That venture didn't get the result we dreamed of, but the vision was planted deep and is still very, very alive to this day. Through that venture, I also learned what it truly means to be all in. And lastly, it taught me I can do whatever I want if I'm willing to go for it. Since I joined that company, I've never had a normal J-O-B, you know, just over broke, ever again. I have never worked a nine to five. I've never worked a restaurant gig. I've never bartended any special events. Since I joined that company, I have been all in on owning my life. Then later, I was introduced to direct sales. One afternoon, Curtis and I were floating the rivers up in Snoqualmie, up in Washington, jumping off bridges, flying off rope swings, and enjoying a beautiful Seattle summer day, as was the norm. When we got to the pole out in North Bend, we met a gentleman named Kendrick. Kendrick took notice of our energy for life and came over to Curtis and me, fresh out of the river. We were still dripping wet, floated down, were exhausted, and he came over and could still sense our energy, so he explained an opportunity he was working on and wanted us to come to a meeting tomorrow morning. We loved the freedom of what we were doing. I mean, think about it. We were floating rivers, jumping off rope swings and bridges all summer long and focusing on our travel business. But at that time, by no means were we making a living. 
at this point, we were about two years into this business. And though we had some people in our organization, it wasn't producing the money that we had got into it for. The dream was looking grim. So we went to the morning meeting that Kendrick had invited us to. This opportunity was Comcast door-to-door sales. It did not provide residuals, but it was time to go make some money. In a later chapter, I'm going to explain what I needed the money for. For now, I'll just say that we started right away. Now, I remember Kendrick as my trainer. I drove out to a neighborhood pretty far out in Seattle and met him there. We went to one house and he signed up a dishwin bag. <laughs> this was the biggest sell that you could make with the highest commission. One door, my training was complete. I saw him make over $500 and I never got to see anybody pitch again. I was now on my own. But apparently that was enough. From the first week in the company, I was the top sales guy. At first, it seemed like I just got lucky, to be honest. The second week, top sales guy. Hmm, more good luck. By the first month, top sales guy consistently, I thought to myself, all right, this isn't luck. I can sell. I can do this, and I can make a living. Personally, direct sales was such a relief compared to multi-level marketing because I was in the driver's seat. I was in control. My successes and failures fell on me and me only. I loved it. Over the next two years or so, I ended up traveling the country on motorcycle. Again, more about this in the upcoming chapter, Blind Faith. And as a national trainer with the group, I was able to make a ton of money. I would work really hard and then take trips. Never forget, the goal was to constantly be on vacation. The traveling lifestyle was finally being fulfilled, but the income stopped every time I took a trip and I stopped working. I loved what I was doing. I'm so thankful for that business because it showed me the difference between multi-level marketing and direct sales. At that time, I was living half my dream by taking vacations here and there, but I was not fulfilling the second half of the dream, which was residual income. That is, until the phone call that would forever change my life. Ring, ring, ring. Hey, Joe, this is Anthony Smith. What are you up to these days? Uh, not much, man. I made it to Florida, just training sales reps all over the USA, but honestly, I'm kind of ready for the next thing. What do you have going on? Well, I'm opening an office in Seattle, and I thought of you, man. I could use a right-hand man, and you could go back to Florida with your own office after learning this business. You interested? In blind faith, you're going to get a better understanding of what I had to do to get to Florida, which was my passion to begin with. It was my dream. I was living there, and I had made it. At first, I second-guessed joining Anthony. I asked that he send me a comp plan and evaluated the business structure. I would compare reviewing that business plan like the evening I first learned about residual income and travel. I could see my future on track again with the future I wanted to begin with when I joined the multi-level marketing. As I reviewed the business, all the fireworks started going off in my head. Boom, it had residual income. Boom, the commissions were great. Boom, there was no sales boundaries, which meant I could travel anywhere in the United States and sell it. Boom, it was direct sales. So that meant it was up to me to make it happen and not building some downline I didn't know. It hit all the nails on the head. The vision kicked in and I was ready. I had found the route that would accomplish my ultimate goal of financial freedom and endless travel. And yes, it is the payment processing business. I was all in, baby, from day one. The decision was made within 24 hours, and I let Anthony know he could count on me being there day one when he opened his office. Within 72 hours, I sold my motorcycles. I sold any possessions I had, which weren't a lot back then because I moved around, and I moved back to my home in rainy Seattle in the middle of winter where it's gloomy and wet, the opposite of my dream life, to begin the journey to finally live up to my dreams and talents becoming a reality. And hey, with my work ethic and sales abilities, I figured I wouldn't be in Seattle any more than a couple months anyways before I'd be back in Florida, down in Miami, opening my office. How hard could payment processing be? Only time would tell. A lesson.
In 1519, Captain Hernan Cortez landed in what would later be Veracruz to begin his great conquest. Upon arriving, he gave the orders to his men to burn the ships. Sir Cortez burned his ships so that his men would have to conquer or die. This is one of my favorite stories of all time, and it is the only way to fully see what you are made of. I don't care what the endeavor is. If you have a plan B, then you have allowed the possibility of failure before you even begin. I believe in a taking a short of death, I will succeed attitude towards everything. When it comes to payment processing, you're going up against a strong opponent, including the industry as a whole, the business owners you're going to encounter other competition, other companies. Going in with an attitude of anything less than all in is setting yourself up to a willingness to quit when it gets tough. This business is full of rejection. It's full of ups and downs. There's so many factors outside of your control. I highly encourage you to come into it prepared for nothing short of pushing through anything that comes your way. Because on the other side of all the challenges and obstacles within this industry our financial freedom. Would you do anything for true freedom? I hope the answer is yes. And I'm talking about the kind of freedom that allows you to do what you want, where you want, and when you want because of time and money freedom. Again, what would you do for that result? Go all in. Short of death, you must succeed. If freedom is your ultimate goal, then this is the right industry for you. The people who have a plan B fail. The people who will die before they willingly quit, make it. Some people are going to think that is really extreme. But I'm telling you, after dealing with thousands of people, the ones that come in and see how things are going to work, don't make it. The ones that come in and say, I am going to do this short of death. There's nothing that can stop me are the ones that make it. Why? It is hard. But it is worth it. Chapter action steps. What is your plan B? Trick question. Get rid of the plan B. Commit now to being financially free, making this business your life for a season of your life. Make this what you do and get damn good at it. It will not happen overnight, that I can promise. But commit to learning and practicing every day and like anything, you will eventually master it and find yourself with a thriving portfolio that pays for your lifestyle and bills. Go all in. Burn the ships. Short of death, you must succeed. Chapter 2. A gamble or a guarantee. The Google definition of gamble states, quote, take risky action in the hope of a desired result, end quote. I remember the feeling when I was sitting in Florida and received the call from Anthony Smith. He explained to me the opportunity. I looked it over and quickly made the decision to move back to Seattle. It was never a decision of, ah, let's go back to Seattle and see how this goes, or, well, if all else fails, I can always come back. It was never, ever anything except this is the vehicle that I'm going to finally fulfill my dream and become financially free and travel with. I believe in myself wholeheartedly. While the world thinks being confident is borderline cocky, I don't really care what the world thinks. I live in my shoes. I wake up every day with me and I have to live with what I make for myself. So knowing that I am in control of the outcomes in my life is one of my greatest attributes, I think. Because it means I'm never gambling. I'm actually guaranteed the outcome because I know once I'm all in, I will win. It may not go as quickly and smoothly as you plan, but in the end, if you have that sort of confidence, you will accomplish what you set your mind to because only you can beat yourself. If I know that only I can beat myself, I will not beat myself. It's up to me. If I'm in control of everything I do, then I'm in control of the outcome as well. This is the number one principle of successful people. They are in control, nobody else. To me, diving all in and moving back to Seattle was far from a gamble. There was nothing risky about it. Actually, I was already guaranteed the outcome of freedom and travel. Why? 
because I'm putting all the chips on myself and short of death, nothing can stop me. Now, since this business provides literally freedom, then how could I not accomplish it? How could not accomplishing it even be a thought that is allowed to linger within my head for more than a millisecond? It's not an option. It is not a reality that my brain is capable of imagining and definitely accepting. I think people who gamble on their future are missing this unshakable confidence or they are in the wrong vehicle or they believe society's norms that being confident is too cocky and you're not supposed to do that. Screw that. Be confident in yourself. How could you lose if you're a sure bet? I love to promote this as the greatest business that exists for so many reasons. And here's another one for you. It's on you. You are in control of if it's a gamble or if it's a guarantee. It's nothing more than your mindset. Sure, you're going to have to align with a processor. And they are like a partner to you. So I encourage you to choose wisely. And I'll go into this more later. But as long as you're with the right group, you'll have the partnership to lean on for sales support for the training, for the sales aspect, for tech support, for all the back-end departments that salespeople typically want nothing to do with. But ultimately, none of that matters if you aren't upholding your end of the partnership. It's on you to create the results. Nothing moves in the partnership. Nothing happens until you make it happen. So whoever you align with, again, hopefully easy pay, We can't do anything until you make something happen. We're just there to help you once you do. So once you have the right vehicle and know what the outcome is, what's next? Put together goals and define what your outcome is ahead of time and have an unwavering blind faith in your accomplishments by implementing your action plan every day. Can you visualize what your dream life is? Where will you live? Where will you travel? What will you drive? What charities and groups will you contribute to? Not only the what, but who will you be? Who will you become in this journey towards owning your life? Chapter action steps. Make a list of your 6-month, 12-month, 24, and 36-month goals. I go to 36 months because it is enough time for anyone to absolutely build a very healthy residual income stream in this business. Even if it took you three to six months just to learn how to get consistent, 36 months is enough time to absolutely change your life. Then break down what you're willing to do on a daily basis. This is your action plans. You have to understand that achieving goals is a simple breakdown of small actions that if done consistently over time achieves a grand picture. This is called the compound effect. If you haven't read the book, The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy, I highly suggest you do. So for example, here's how the compound effect works. If someone wants to be a doctor, they go backwards from a doctor as their starting point. This means they need to be a college graduate first, right? So to be a college graduate, they need to graduate high school. To graduate high school, They need to get this homework assignment and this paper written by Friday. To get that paper and homework assignment written by Friday, one hour researching and one hour writing the paper over the next five days. This is how you break goals down and decide your action steps. You go backwards, not forward. Write down your goals and break down how you are going to get there. Don't worry about making leaps and bounds. A high school student doesn't worry about going from high school student to doctor. That's not how it works. So focus on making small bite-sized victories and be consistent. I'm telling you, time will do the rest in this business if you can do that. So once you have your goals and action plans determined and set in stone, then only you determine if you succeed or not. For example, if you have a goal to talk to 20 business owners a day, You're the only person that can go home short of talking to 20 business owners that day. It's on you. So to fall behind your goals and quit is like having stocks and selling when it's down. That's your choice. Only a victim blames other people other than themselves if something happens that's not part of the plan. Let me give you a hint here, folks. Victims are always losers. They never win and it's always someone else's fault. Don't be a victim and claim you want to be successful. 
They are the polar opposite of what you want to be. No matter what you're dealing with out there, the doors are closed. The business owners aren't in. There's a pandemic. I'm not good enough. People don't want to do a service fee. All excuses and victim talk, none of them are what successful people in this business. They don't talk like that. They don't think like that. At the end of this book, I share my first year of goals as a lesson. I do this to give you a clear insight into where my head was at when I started this business venture. Failure was never an option. It was never a gamble. It was always, I am going to do this. I am going to learn from people that are already doing this. I am going to mimic people that are having success. I am going to help as many merchants as I possibly can. I welcome obstacles. Today, I will overcome any obstacles that come my way. And short of death, I will build this business so that one day I will own my life and be in Florida. That's the attitude. Set your goals. Set your action plans. And understand, you are a guarantee if you understand you're the only person that can stop yourself. Chapter three, blind faith. God or the universe or however you choose to look at it has this amazing ability to give you exactly what you're able to handle at the perfect time. I strongly believe that and I can't wait to share this story with you. As we navigate the ins and outs and ups and downs of life, if we waited until all the lights were green before we left our house, we would never pull out of the driveway to go towards our goals. Success is attained with small, dedicated baby steps, day in and day out. We arrive at life one intersection at a time and navigate our next move in that moment. It's our job in this life to get to the next light, metaphorically speaking, and then to make the best decision we can at that time with the information that we have, regardless of if the light is green, yellow, or red. Just get to the next light and then decide from there. I really hope that this book pushes you to ask yourself what your next green light move in your life is. You know, my brother used to tell me, you can't just run through life without a plan, Joe. You have to plan ahead. In a way, he was right. However, what he didn't fully understand is that blind faith was my plan. I have always lived with zero doubt that the path will reveal itself at the right time. It's not my job to always know what the plan is years ahead. My job is to be happy and have the vision to be able to see the next open door and make a conscious choice to go through it or not. It is my job in life to see the open doors, to be conscious about them, and to make an educated choice to go through it or not based on the information that I have in that moment. That was my plan and I was always right on track. Can you relate to this? You may not know the exact plan or roadmap to get to the destination of freedom and abundance in all the areas of your life, but without a shadow of a doubt, you have the grit, you're confident, and you have the desire to take the necessary steps to get there once the plan reveals itself. I hope that you're seeing the plan in front of you. Is merchant services that roadmap right now for you? I believe it is. In fact, I know it is. I know someone reading this is seeing that light. I want to work with you if that's how you feel. You know, when I first left home around 21 years old and moved to California, I had no plan. I had very little money. However, the work ethic that I have within me pushed me to go and had blind faith that I'll figure it out. As I mentioned in the first chapter, I met Curtis shortly after arriving in California and joined a multi-level marketing travel company. After about a year working in that industry, I realized the lack of financial and time freedoms were not getting me closer to my goals. Once we started traveling, we would sell packages and we would earn some money that way literally on vacations, in the pool, selling travel packages to strangers. I wasn't making much, but I was living life to the fullest. One step closer to the freedoms I was chasing, right? I'll never forget the first time I landed in Puerto Vallarta. 
when I stepped off that airplane, felt that warm air, and took in a deep breath, I was sold. That trip unlocked the Joe Wagner that I am today because traveling became real. The concept of traveling as a lifestyle while making a residual income has never changed. After that first trip to Mexico, I was certain that I had found the holy grail and the secret to life. And I enthusiastically wanted to get out there and tell every person I knew about this incredible opportunity. I even ended up convincing Curtis that we should move up to up where I had more meaningful relationships and connections. This would obviously allow us to grow a team, and I was sure more people up there would be interested. And I was sure our business would thrive. So we went back to Seattle, and I brought Curtis with me. I quickly realized, what the heck? Other people are not seeing the big picture here. They're not having the same aha moment that I did when I first saw the business or when I first stepped foot in Mexico. It was so frustrating. I wanted others to be enthusiastic about the business just like I was. What was wrong with them? After a year or so in Seattle, we decided it was time for another trip to Puerto Vallarta. This time, however, Curtis and I were about to embark on a three-week all-inclusive trip that would forever change the rest of my life in many aspects. Although I wasn't making substantial amounts of money at the time, the faith in myself still resided within me, and I knew I was on the right path. I was living more than most people will ever experience in their life, and I was still in my early 20s. In those three weeks in Puerto Vallarta, I met individuals who would forever change my future, including my now wife and mother of three kids. Here's where blind faith took my life to a whole other level and pointed me in the right direction. At the end of that three-week trip, we had been drinking tequila for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for 21 nights straight, and we had a long flight back. And we finally landed in rainy Seattle, still in board shorts, head throbbing, and flip-flops as we sat in the rain. In this moment, I looked at Curtis, and I told him, Screw this, man. I'm buying a motorcycle and moving to Florida next month. I'm not sure if he took me serious or not, but I was dead serious. I quickly let my family know the plan as well. The only problem was I didn't have a motorcycle. I didn't have any money, and I didn't have any connections in Florida. None of that crossed my mind. I took yet another leap of blind faith and made the decision before I could even be questioned or doubted. Within two days, two days of Curtis and I getting back to Seattle where I made that commitment is when we met Kendrick as we floated the river. Meeting Kendrick led to me starting direct sales for Comcast going door to door, which was the avenue in which I could make money now. Even working for Comcast as an independent representative, I was still completely in control of my life as a 1099 representative, and I never looked at it as a job. Quickly, seeing how successful and lucrative that business was, I earned enough money, put it in my pocket so that I could buy a motorcycle and head across the country to my paradise, Florida. After one month of continually being the top salesperson and making well over $10,000, one morning I came in and I thanked Kendrick and Sam for the amazing opportunity to learn the business, and to build my confidence at Comcast. I was a new person. I had gone from two years in multi-level marketing, not making killer money, to one month in direct sales and killed it. But they were shocked. What do you mean you're leaving, Joe? Why didn't you mention you were planning on leaving? As I go through this, this was the most unbelievable experience of blind faith and life putting the plan right in your lap because... I get chills as I say this because if I didn't continue to move forward with blind faith, even when there was no realistic plan, and if I never trusted myself without a shadow of a doubt, life may not have opened the doors necessary to continue towards a path of freedom, which is who I am. So Sam, who was the owner and Kendrick's boss at that time, then proceeded to tell me after I told him I wasn't going to be there anymore So Joe, I've been wanting to open an office in Florida. How about I meet you down there and you can be the national trainer? Boom. Life delivered. In a matter of a month of me being in Mexico, 
landing back in Seattle without a motorcycle, without the means of creating money to get one, without any opportunities or relationships in Florida. Life opened the doors to create the money, buy the motorcycle, and show me that I can thrive in direct sales. And even made a connection for work and relationships when I arrived in Florida. Fuck yeah, Sam. I'm going to go travel the country on my new motorcycle. I'll see you in a month. I couldn't believe it. Just imagine, I walked in thinking I was going to tell Sam that I was leaving the office and going to begin a 3,000 mile journey to Florida and I didn't have a plan. Instead of that, I'm now leaving the office on the same 3,000 mile journey, but now with a purpose when I arrive in Florida. Unbelievable. It was and is, as I say this, an incredible feeling of life always delivers kind of moment. The next 30 days, I traveled some of the most beautiful destinations in America. At the end of this book, see my bonus lesson called the laptop bag lesson, where I discuss some of the places on my first journey. When I got to Florida, we rented a three-bedroom penthouse in Jacksonville, only steps away from the beach. My dream from two months prior at that airport when I told Curtis, screw this, I'm buying a motorcycle and moving to Florida, was now a reality but I also had a vehicle to make money. I had a reason to be there and an opportunity. From there, I worked with Sam for a while. I did national training trips to other offices around the United States. I've always led the company in sales, literally from day one in Seattle, all the way to the end working with them. This vehicle created the ability to travel when I wanted, and then I had to come home and keep working Because again, the money would stop coming in when I stopped hitting doors making sales. So after long enough, I kind of got bored and I wanted, I just wanted more than just making money. So I tried to go out and open my own door-to-door business. I ended up riding my motorcycle back to Washington from Florida for my second lap around the United States, down to California, back to Florida again over the next year, just kind of making some sales here and there. It was great. I would stop where I wanted, I'd spend some time there, and I would keep moving forward. In a way, especially for my early 20s, I owned my life, but not like I do today because the residual income wasn't there. If I stopped working, so did the money. So on this one-year hiatus where I was traveling the United States, trying to figure out my own thing on motorcycle, is where I actually met Anthony Smith. We didn't work together that long, but the relationship was founded as I was out on my adventures. Little did I know that relationship would later shape the rest of my life. It took about a year after meeting Anthony for me to get back to Florida, where I was when my phone rang with the call that ultimately changed my life and hit all the bases on the head, what I was looking for. The vehicle that had everything that a person desiring freedom could want The commissions were great. It paid residual income. It had no boundaries. That was the journey that blind faith put me through before landing me on the ultimate opportunity that exists in America, which obviously is payment processing. My life as I knew it was all preparing me for the real challenges ahead from this point on, which was building a merchant service empire and conquering my life by owning my life. Had I not moved forward with blind faith, I would not have accidentally even found this vehicle. So if you don't have a plan, it's okay as long as you're moving forward doing something. Don't give up. I mentioned earlier in this chapter that this journey of blind faith is where I met my wife and mother of three children, Pal Wagner. She met a young Joe Wagner at a pool bar in Puerto Vallarta who had full confidence that I could get whatever I wanted. I promised I'd see her again from that trip in Mexico and deliver her an amazing life prior to even embarking in merchant services. I knew she was going to be my wife. Blind Faith delivered that too. Chapter Action Steps Take some time and ask yourself, am I someone who goes with the flow of life or do I always have to have everything mapped out? Do I always have to be in control? 
it's easy to justify having everything planned out in your life. And as adults, it is important to some extent. However, being completely fixated on a plan for yourself without any room for redirection does not leave room for blind faith and allowing life to deliver and open new doors for you. Your vision gets shut off so you can't see the open doors if you're too set on a strict plan. For the young adult readers who don't have families or an ex extensive laundry list of responsibilities, are you falling into society's plan of always having a plan? Or are you open to taking a chance, putting forward the action, and walking down an avenue that will take you closer to your dreams? For the older listeners, coming up to retirement and looking for your exit plan, I encourage you to adopt the mindset of the youth. Have blind faith that things will work out once you know what it is that you want to work out. Release the tight grip you have on controlling every aspect of your life. And have faith in yourself that you will build this business and change the outcome of your life. I speak to the older listeners that are coming up on retirement because I speak to so many of you over the last couple of years. You may not have something saved up but have blind faith that this vehicle will be your retirement. It doesn't take that long. You've been working your whole life anyways. If you give this business everything you have for 12 to 36 months and beyond, you will retire more comfortable than you've ever been in your life. And don't just have faith when you do it. Have blind faith that the outcome is already yours and just take baby steps, small actions on a daily basis. Chapter four, it's just math. This is one of my favorite parts about this business because if we can all agree that 10 plus 10 equals 20, then we can all agree that this business is nothing more than just math. So even to this day, I remember what was one of my favorite school projects of all time. I was in eighth grade and what the project was, was we were to create a football team for every state. All right, so obviously that's 50 states. And we were also required to write information about each state, such as the state flower, the popular foods, culture, things like that that are relevant to the state, times 50. So that means 50 different pages, one for each state, each one a football team. The project was given to us on a Monday. We had one month to complete the project, and with a room full of 30 or so kids, you can imagine there was a mixed emotions. Some of us loved it because we were into sports, and some not so much, but one thing we all agreed on was 50 pages, right? So that's 50 pages of drawing, 50 pages in states of studying and writing about. It was just like a, ah, oh, this is gonna take forever kind of moment. Like the task itself seemed so big and overwhelming and I'll never forget when I, I came home complaining to my mom and she just, she's just like, Joey, it's, it's just math. Like, what does this project have to do with math? This, this has nothing to do with math. What are you talking about? So she explained it. She said, Joey, you have 30 days and there's 50 separate states. Don't focus on the huge task of doing 50. It's not like you're going to do all of them tonight, right? Like, of course not. Heck no. Definitely not. Okay. Well, let me show you that it's much easier when you just break down the math. There's 50 teams and you have 30 days. In our house, we didn't work on Sunday because of the Sabbath, so that would leave us with 26 days of working on the project. So if you take 50 and divide it by 26 days, you only have to complete roughly two per day. Can you do two of these per day, Joey? Of course I can, that's easy. I think that the power of this business can be looked at in a very, very similar way. Especially for the big thinkers, we're looking at a huge amount of deals, a huge amount of residual income, and, and it can be a massive task when we look at it that way. Not only in terms of the dollar amount, but the actions that are going to be necessary for this huge amount of deals and to be financially free. It can be a little overwhelming, especially for us very, very large and aggressive thinkers. So what I highly encourage you to do is take a look at the financial goals that you have and break them down. Find out what your yearly, monthly, weekly, and even daily projections need to be for you to be in the realm of your goals. This will make it much simpler and break it down to a daily level. 
After all, it's all just math. This will also allow you to see if you are being realistic in your expectations. For example, if you have a goal so high that it requires you to sign seven merchant accounts per day, six days a week, then you know that you might be a little bit out of the realm of reality. I'm all about, all about aiming really, really high. But if you're the kind of person who gets discouraged easily, then you also want to make sure that you're making obtainable commitments and expectations for yourself. We don't want you to feel like you're failing when you're actually making small bite-sized progresses, which is what this business is actually all about. Before I give an example, let me also share some important math with you. As I write this book, we're laser focused on the cash discount program. It is 100% of what I focus on. I could write a whole book on why the cash discount program has completely changed the game, but to break it down in simple terms and move on, it has allowed us as merchant sales representatives to grow our residual income by five to 10 times as fast as what we used to be able to do. So just imagine, right now you can get the same amount of deals and it is as profitable via residual income five to 10 times as much as what it used to be. That means what I was able to accomplish in my first five years in the business, you can get done in your first year. It is that big of a deal. So more than ever, if you think this is gonna take a long time, I couldn't disagree with you more. It has never been easier. We've never been able to help merchants on a larger scale and you've never been able to build your portfolio faster than it is right now, okay? You are literally in this industry at the perfect time and I'm just gonna leave it at that. So let's get into a little bit of math. Let me give you an example. If you have the physical copy of the book or if you printed the PDF, uh, the math and the numbers might be easier to follow, but I'm gonna throw them out there, okay? So if your goal is $100,000 in annual residual income, right? It's part of the title of my book. So if your goal is $100,000 in annual residual income, and the average account pays $100 per month. So you got $100,000 divided by 12 months is $8,333 and some change per month. That's how much you'd be making in residual income per month to hit your goal. Break it down a little more. So to make $8,333 per month in residual, if the average account pays $100, then that means in your first year, you need to sign 83 accounts, 83.33. We're going to round up or down here. Okay, so 83.33 accounts is what you need in your first year to hit $100,000 in annual residual income based on these numbers. Let's break it down a little more because it's all just math. 83 accounts divided by 12 months equals seven accounts per month. Completely doable. Let's break it down a little more. You've got 30 days in the average month. You need seven accounts. That is less than two deals per week. I would literally have to sign one deal every 4.28 days to rebuild a six-figure residual income, and that's in the first year. One deal every 4.28 days. That's doable. But let's keep going even more. Let's break it down even more. If I figure I need to talk to 50 people for one deal and I have 4.28 days to do that, then I literally only need to talk to 11 to 12 people a day. This is how it's possible for me or for you to go create a six-figure residual income within 180 to 365 days, just like the title of the book suggests. This is real, this isn't a pipe dream. So based on your own math, and when I say math, I'm talking about how many doors do you need to talk to in order to get a deal on average, right? That, that math is gonna be different for you than it is for me, than it is for the next person. But once you figure out a rough idea what that number is, you can see how this is literally just math and you can break it down to the amount of doors on average per day that you need to hit to stay on track, for this math equation to get you to your ultimate goal, in this example, six-figure residual income within your first year. Very obtainable, and when you break it down like this, it's just that much easier. 
Now, I just want to throw it out there. What I just went over was an example, okay? Talking to 11 to 12 people a day is not very high numbers. That's not like a, I'm in it to win it, short of death I will succeed, attack mode mentality. However, I'm just giving you an example of how simply breaking it down by math makes this whole business for you. But what I want to really encourage you is to get way past those weak numbers. Those are for toe dippers who stop based on the number of doors they hit rather than the results that they're getting in a day. I want to see you max out your day. Get momentum on your side. And just imagine if this math is true, then to your ability, how much faster can you actually get it done by going beyond these minimal numbers that I'm giving you right now? Are you having success and enjoying the game? One of the most exciting parts of this business is comparing the deals that you get to your current bills. Let me explain. I've always looked at deals as bills being paid. So for example, if I go and sign a $30,000 account and I know that roughly there's about 1% residual income, then on a $30,000 account, I can roughly calculate $300 in residual income from that one deal. So what I always did is I'm like, all right, that's $300. What bills do I have? So if you, had, if you were paying $100 for cable and internet, $100 for car insurance, maybe another $100 for your cell phone plan, those bills can now be considered paid all because of that one $30,000 account. When you break it down like this, it's just fun. It becomes a game, right? You no longer have to trade time for money to pay those specific bills. It is absolutely unbelievable and it's one of the biggest pieces of motivation you can receive. At least it always was and is for me. And that's the name of the game, folks. Pay off your bills one at a time via the deals you sign until there are no longer bills to trade time for money for. From there, that's when the fun begins. From there, that's when you start to build your lifestyle and you start saying that you own your life. After all, it's just math, folks. Chapter action steps. One, write down a list of your monthly living expenses itemized individually. Two, break down each bill that you have. Three, place this spreadsheet next to your goals where they can be seen and begin tracking the bills being paid with residual income. Put these somewhere you can see. Watch financial freedom happen literally in front of your eyes as you're going out there and getting results. Number four, how fast can you reduce your bills with residual income to trading your time for money to zero? As soon as you do that, congratulations, you're free. Then it's time to begin building your dream lifestyle. Folks, this is just math. Don't overthink it. Figure out your equation. Get results. Time will do the rest. You will own your life if you follow the math equation. Chapter five, the five unbreakable fundamentals. The fundamentals I'm gonna outline in this chapter are absolutely essential in building a successful cash discount slash merchant service business. So pay attention here. If your goal is to master being able to be productive any day, anytime you choose, anywhere USA, then strive to apply these five fundamentals every moment of every day that you are out in the field. These fundamentals did not take me years to learn, but they did take me years in the business and many failures to actually identify that they were consciously being applied. Although I've always succeeded in merchant sales because I applied them, it wasn't until years later when I was very heavy into training people that I really identified them as to why I could go anywhere, anytime and sign a massive amount of deals. Here's how I identified them. So Clint and I were running a door-to-door -door operation in Los Angeles. Our team was pumping. We were, we were pumping anywhere from 180 to over 200 new applications a month doing door-to-door -door in Los Angeles. And at that time, I was still spending most of my weekdays in the field. I was training people. That's, that's always been my specialty. All the way back to the Comcast door-to-door, -door, it was taking people in the field and actually showing how to sell this product. Long story short, I felt like I was carrying more of the weight in terms of 
teaching the sales and growing the sales numbers. And at the end of the day, sales is what makes the business run in any business. And after long enough, I felt like I was carrying that weight. I, I was getting frustrated. So I decided to pull out of the office and I just remember thinking to myself, if, if no one's going to help me on my end, then I'll just go out there and kill the game and do it myself. Right? The amount of time and energy training other people's teams, which uh, it was a lot of my frustration, you know, that's kind of slowing down my equation. You know, plus I make way more residuals on my own deal. So I'm just going to get out there. So it was at this point when I walked away from the office that I got myself into this mindset. I literally convinced myself that I was the Michael Jordan, the MJ of the payment processing industry. In my head, I was actually the best that ever lived playing this game of signing merchant accounts. At this point in my business, I was going anywhere USA. I could walk down any street and was guaranteed a minimum of a deal a day. That'd be a bad day. I was going to prove it too. So I began a project that I called Project Impossible. The goal was to sell 100 merchant accounts single-handedly by myself. 100 accounts was the goals for the offices of the company that I worked with at that time. The offices were signing 100, so my goal was to go do it single-handedly. I really believed it, and it began to snowball into a huge amount of success right away. Project Impossible was going to be a full month sales run. That means I would be driving thousands of miles, staying in hotels every night, time away from my family, and nothing but grinding during business hours. The first week was the biggest week I've had to this day. 24 deals, single-handedly. The second week, I signed 20. Every aspect was flowing. Every pitch had the right energy, and it seemed like Life was literally just putting the right decision makers in front of me at every door. And then the trip was ended short by a family emergency. I had to rush home after two weeks of being on the sales run. So I never got to finish that trip, but I proved to myself that I was capable of creating an elite business. I ended up with 44 accounts. And at that time I was preparing for my wedding and I had earned enough in commission money in two weeks to pay for my portion of a badass wedding in Mexico. Sometimes I wonder how many deals I could have actually got if I had that full month. The answer to that, I'll never know. But I can tell you, when I got my mind to that level, the results surely followed. I've never really gotten my mind back to that same intense level of, you know, I'm the best ever. It wasn't intended to be permanent and I intentionally went overboard for this experiment, and I never really wanted to hold it forever. You know, I don't want to be that overly cocky. I'm confident at, at that month, I was feeling cocky. The lesson on believing in yourself at a level 10 plus was learned loud and clear though. I've since taken hundreds of trips, and each one, I carry a blind faith guarantee that I am one of the greatest. This mentality has helped me produce 10 plus deals a week on average, on all my sales trip for multiple years counting. Less than 10 would have been considered a slower week. So the first road trip after Project Impossible, I was driving and I had this aha moment, like the light just went off and the epiphany on how I could help anyone be more successful. They needed to understand the fundamentals to succeed in this business. That was the big aha moment for me to help others be able to do this. And there is no real big secret. You just have to master the fundamentals. That means executing the fundamentals every single pitch and believing success is yours. That's it. There's no secret sauce. So once I really identified them, I pulled the car over and I wrote down what I now refer to as the five unbreakable fundamentals. Being a professional is nothing more than being able to execute the basics flawlessly over and over and over again. Professionals never change the basics. Even if a professional does something that looks a little fancier from the outside to us, the formula and the fundamentals are still what it is founded on. I guarantee it. Think about it. What did Michael Jordan practice more? Free throws or slam dunks from the free throw line? 
Which does Tom Brady practice more? The basic quarterback mechanics or throwing Hail Marys? If being a professional is nothing more than the basics over and over again, then what are the basics of selling the cash discount program and what do you need to get good at? So here they are. The five unbreakable fundamentals. Number one, never stop prospecting. Number two, your first impression. Number three, being likable. Number four, mastering common rebuttals. And number five, the bridge to the close. No awkward closing. Let's go over number one, never stop prospecting. Folks, you cannot cheat playing the numbers game. You are going to have to get rejected often in order to get the yeses. That's part of your equation. How many no's do I need to get for every yes on average? Never think that your pipeline is so full of deals that you can take your foot off the gas. You can't. Your pipeline shouldn't always be full of follow-up because that means the prospects aren't signing up with you. They're just telling you to keep coming back. So you have to continue to constantly keep finding new potential targets and customers. Never stop. Something that almost 100% of new sales partners seem to have is the bad habit of thinking everyone who says they're interested and could you please come back are actually hot leads. If you're a follow-up type of person, that's fine. I'm not going to bash it. But never think all the follow-up is serious enough to stop prospecting new deals every day all the time. You must constantly pursue new deals and new people ready to do business now. Not tomorrow, today. It is all too common for new sales partners to end up finding out how true this really is after much disappointment and wasting the first couple of weeks that they're in this business chasing deals. You want to know how you know when someone is serious about doing business with you? When they are doing business with you and do paperwork. That's how you know. Other than that, you need to avoid chasing deals. You can do follow-up all you want and not take this advice, but please pursue them knowing that every time you leave without the deal, starting from the very first contact that you made, your odds go down significantly. Not a little bit, significantly. This means your best chance of getting that deal is your first contact. When they're telling you they're interested, when you've shown them the fees are gone, when you've broke down their savings and they give you some reason why you need to come back in five days, you need to get good at figuring out how to come to a decision today. This is the kind of stuff that I specifically train on because I know coming back in five days, no matter how awesome they are, no matter how much they said they're going to sign up and promised you, they can be a completely different person in five days and your chances drop significantly after leaving on your first contact. Not saying don't do follow up. Some people are great at building pipeline. There's more deals today than there is tomorrow, always. Number two, making a good first impression. C factors is something we've always taught. The acronym is smile, eye contact, and enthusiasm. Smiling is contagious. So do it while you're acknowledging the person you're approaching. This alone is going to break the ice and discourage them from cutting you off long before you even tell them what you're offering. The first thing a prospect should see when they see you walk in the door is a smile on your face. Nobody wants to follow someone who's not excited about what they're doing. Someone who believes in what they have is absolutely sold on it. And we're going to go over a whole chapter on this. So if you believe you're helping someone with your offer... It should radiate from your energy and specifically the smile on your face. They won't have a choice but to be curious and at least hear out what it is that you have to offer. Number three, being likable. This is very similar to the C factors and your first impression, except being likable goes past the first 10 seconds of your pitch. It's the whole meeting. When you think about a likable person that you just met, What qualities do they possess? Pause for a moment. Reflect on this. We all know what makes somebody likable when you first meet them. Things like smiling. They're laughing. They listen to you. 
as a sales rep, they're respectful, right? They don't come in and bash what you have. They don't bash competitors, right? This is an attack on that business owner's decision-making skills. What are you, dumb? Why did you sign up with that company? Come with me. No, don't do that. They ask engaging questions. So, so think to yourself, do you possess these quality traits that make somebody likable? If not, the good news is that all of them can be improved by consciously applying them and then eventually they become natural. Eventually, you will do them unconsciously if you practice them enough and they just become a part of your pitch. Now let's go over the last two fundamentals. These are the skills of selling merchant accounts. Number four, mastering common rebuttals. Ooh. The good news about rebuttals is that they're almost always the exact same regardless of where you sell in the United States. So you need to learn how to get really good at these because you're going to have to consistently be beating the same rebuttals and it is probably the most critical part of consistently getting to the paperwork and getting deals. The rebuttals are very consistent. So having the consistent answers to raise your averages and walking away with the deal is crucial. Overcoming rebuttals are the basics, right? They're the fundamentals to master in order to become a professional, right? A professional just executes the basics correctly over and over and over again. So overcoming rebuttals in this business are those basics. You need to consistently overcome them and they are consistent coming towards you as well. So this is the part of the business that's equivalent to, you know, taking the free throw shot or practicing those basic quarterback fundamentals for Tom Brady. Execute the basics correctly over and over and over again. And then one day you'll wake up and realize, damn, I'm a professional. And then number five, the bridge to the close. I would actually say that this is the number one deal breaker and the thing that separates sales reps that are elite in the business, which is 20 plus per month, and those that are not. So imagine the elite versus the non-elite at the same door. They've covered all the details of the cash discount program. They've answered all the rebuttals. Yet two reps at the same door could constantly leave without paperwork and the other one will get paperwork. Why is that? It's because they have an awkward close and their transition is not smooth, AKA they don't have a bridge to the close. They don't understand how to cover the gap between doing the presentation and actually closing the deal. This is huge. This is your whole business because all the talk means nothing if you don't get apps. So mastering common rebuttals and how to bridge to the close are the subjects that I specifically focus on in my online training and in my rebuttals library. So if you're struggling with closing deals but are great at gaining interest, you're willing to put in the hard work, then I can help you with that. That's, that's literally what I focus on. So for more information on those two aspects of the business, make sure that you're plugged into the free training content I put out there. Make sure you have your login to my cash discount online training and also the Netflix of rebuttals and bridge to close. These are going to teach you how to do it. And I don't just talk about how to do it. I show you from the field how to do it. If you haven't checked that out, then make sure that you do. So let's face it. Anyone can go out and share a program that eliminates merchant fees, but not everyone can close deals. You might be experiencing that. If it were easy, then nobody would ever quit the business and everyone who even remotely tried would be financially free, right? All of the above are the basics, and anyone can learn to do them if they do not come naturally already. The most important fundamentals are definitely mastering the common rebuttals and the bridge to the close. They are what will separate the elite from the non-elite. Some people are more natural at specific things than others, but the same skill level can be accomplished if the, if the effort and the willingness to fail and try again is applied. In school, some people can just attend class, kind of halfway listen and get A's on their tests, right? Other students, like me, are horrible at retaining the information during the class. To top it off, 
people like me have to reread the information in a book over and over again for it to stick. But the truth is, with enough effort and commitment, both students can get the same grade. In the end, both students can understand the same topic in an applicable manner, even though it took one almost no effort because it was natural, and the other it took restless nights and long days of studying because it was unnatural. At the end, they can both have the same skill and grade and understanding. Success in this business is a learnable skill. So it doesn't matter how long it takes you if, if in the end you still attain financial freedom. In this business, results multiplied by time equals financial freedom and owning your life. It's worth any amount of time that it takes to get good at it. So if at the beginning you have to work harder, you have to fail more, you have to be more persistent, just know it's what you're required to do to understand how to make this business work for you, okay? Everyone has their own story and learning curve. So don't compare yourself to others that took off right out of the gate and had huge success or somebody had a better month than you did. Focus on your success, your growth, and do the best that you can do. That's all you have anyways. And I beg you, be willing to have a learning curve. I didn't come into this business signing 10 deals a week when I first started. That's not how it happened. So keep in mind that you must be willing to be a student and accept coaching methods if that's what's necessary in case it doesn't click for you effortlessly. Now I want to share a, an uncommon story with you. I, I love this story. Um, I, I had a sales partner. His name was Kevin. Uh, great guy. Still a great friend. Still in communication. And when, when he came in, you know, he was young. He lived with his parents, which means he had very low or next to no bills, right? So his his bar to own his life was low because was, because his bills were low. And one thing that me and him connected on right out of the gate was he is a huge Robert Kiyosaki fan, as am I. Okay, so I say that because he was totally sold on the strategy of residual income and was going to get it no matter what. Only problem for Kevin when he came into Easy Pay and saw the vehicle was he sucked at sales. <laughs> I will tell him this on the phone. We can laugh about it because it was true, okay? For three months, Kevin would call almost every day, usually from the field and also at the end of the day, multiple times a day. It was always for advice on how to handle this or that and how to get better and overcome something. Not only was he trying hard, but he was out there learning. He was getting real life experiences by failing. Only problem was he still wasn't signing any deals, okay? So in three months, of Kevin going out with a level 10 effort, he still had zero deals and was putting in more work than most other people in the company. So it was very, very clear that Kevin was in it to win it. But when the hell were his sell skills gonna kick in? <laughs> so I had to invest in him. I had to, he wanted it. Not because of the results he was getting, that was zero, but because his burning desire and refusal to quit was level 10. So I invited Kevin to come down to South Florida and called him up, said, hey man, we're going to go to Grant Cardone. We're going to go to a 10X conference. We're going to meet in person. I got your airfare. You know, we're going to go with a couple other uh, top producers. And, and I brought him down to hang out with some producers, even though he wasn't a producer, but he had the heart of one. Well, the following week between that phone call and the Grant Cardone, Kevin went out and signed not only his first deal, not only his second deal, not only his third deal, but four deals. So I asked Kevin, like, what changed? Now, he said he did not want to come meet me and other producers without having produced. So what he did is he homed in on the bridge to close and stopped believing that people were going to sign up later. He stopped chasing deals and he turned his mind into a now or never mentality and didn't leave a business in his pipeline. He either left with the deal or was going to move on. It was the overcome rebuttals now and get the deal or it's not going to happen mentality that switched in him and he started producing. Needless to say that now over two years later, Kevin is doing awesome. Uh, he's completely financially free and his strategy of building residual income is growing monthly. Kevin, great work, man. I knew you had it. I'm so glad that I made that investment in you. Great job. 
Kevin's story is definitely not one that I wish on anybody. But it is a real testament of being willing to do whatever it takes to learn how to do this business. Because the result is freedom. Kevin understood that and it's what drove him. Never forget that. You're doing this so that you will have time and money freedom. There is no cost too great. You must learn how to do this at all costs. Once you have the skills, go full speed ahead. Don't let anything stop you from getting the next app. Once you have the skill, it's next, 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 next. Build that equation one next app at a time. Chapter action steps. Of the five fundamentals, which is the easiest for you? Which do you struggle with? Are you seeing the value of what this business can do once you master the five fundamentals and can produce at any given time? Sit down and think, write, discuss with somebody the five fundamentals and be honest with yourself. Are you applying all of them? Because if you're missing just one of these fundamentals, especially number four and five, then you're shorting yourself, even if you are getting results. You might not even be getting deals at all. Are you open to changing that? Are you ready to do this right? And are you open to coaching if necessary? If you are, I'd love to work with you. What are you willing to do in order to achieve success in this business? At this point in the book, my listeners, I'm sure the answer is whatever it takes. Chapter six, the four levels of action. I was in Seattle for Thanksgiving with my wife and two kids. As we write this book, I now have three. We were visiting with my family, and while I was there, I got a couple comments along the lines of, you're, you're getting on the big side, Joe. That comment was the accumulation of unhealthy eating, lacking any fitness routine, and smoking cigarettes for a little bit too long. Although the statement was true and valid, those types of comments encouraged me to take an honest look at the choices I had made during that time in my life, and I definitely was not on the path to be my best self. So when we got back to Florida a couple days later after Thanksgiving, I remember I was on the computer and a Facebook ad popped up for a Spartan race. So after browsing their website for a couple minutes, I saw that one was going to be in Florida coming up. So there was two options for this race. It was one for three miles, which is called a sprint, and that has 25 obstacles, or there's the beast race, which is 12 plus miles and 40 obstacles. I knew that the three mile race was totally doable, even with me being overweight and out of shape, but I remember I don't dabble at anything, so I called my my buddy Danny. Danny, what's going on, man? I'm gonna sign us up for this 12 plus mile Spartan race. You down? I don't know, Joe, that seems a little much. When, When is this? Oh, it's in 13 days. What? What's wrong with you, man? 13 days? That's not enough time to get ready for a 12-mile race. Come on, Danny. We're doing it, man. We'll make the adjustments we need to make right now. Worst case scenario, we can just walk it, man. Don't be a wimp. Come on. All right, man. Vamanos. Let's go. Immediate and massive action was at play the minute we signed up and then actually paid for our spots in the Spartan race. Out with the smoking and junk food and in with the daily routines. I instantly changed every aspect of my life to mimic someone who was actually ready to complete a 12-mile Spartan race. In the end, were we ready for what ended up being 13.7 miles? Heck no! But we took it one step at a time, and eventually we jumped over the flaming logs to cross the finish line the same as anybody else. We ended the race the same as the professional racers and people who were actually prepared and confident. We received the same medal that they received. So here's the thing. Life does not give different medals for those that are prepared and ready. Medals are given for specific outcomes. If you wait until you're ready all the time, it'll never happen. It's one of the secrets of life. You don't have to be ready in order to commit to something. It's normally the other way around. It's Once you fully commit to starting, then massive actions will follow and the game plan will reveal itself. I believe we are naturally designed to grow. That's literally when we're at our best, when we're in the pursuit of something. We are designed to want to be better. So since this book is not for average people, 
I'm sure most of you can relate. You're at your best when you're in the pursuit of something. You get laser focused on its accomplishment, and then as soon as you accomplish it, your mind is already like, all right, got it, what's next? That's human nature at its best in my opinion. It's a good thing. While average people will tell you it's not okay, I believe we're naturally designed to always be in the pursuit of growing bigger, growing stronger, and being more fulfilled as a person and as a contributor to the greatness and good things on this planet. The pursuit or the hunt is what we're in love with. Not necessarily the medal or the money or recognition. When I talk about working to create financial freedom so that later on you don't have to work and trade time for money, it's so that you can still live at a level of massive action just towards bigger and better goals beyond making money. Things like helping others. Things like contributing. Trading time for money steals your years of time to grow and contribute. So let's just get it out of the way. Get it done. I really think it's unfortunate that people quickly get trapped in the chapter of life of earning money. It does not have to last until you die or 67 and a half years old. I believe it's simply meant to be a chapter of life, not life. And I prefer it to be as short as possible. So becoming financially free as quickly as possible is the obvious choice if you'd like to move on to the next chapter of your life without the stress of earning money and trading your time for it all the time. So in order to do this, we've identified four levels of actions or four types of people that build this business. So which of these four types of people are you? You have the do-nothing individuals. These are the people, they don't, they don't even try. They, they find out about payment processing but choose not to take advantage of it. That's fine, their choice. But it's not just this industry, it's life. This category of people assumes everything. They assume it's going to be hard. They assume no one's going to be interested. They assume no one's going to want to add a fee. They assume they can't, or even worse, they say they could, but they make an excuse of why they don't make an effort. If you could, you would. The category is full of the losers of the world telling everyone that they're wrong even though they aren't even attempting to complete the task or projects that they're telling others they're wrong about or that they can't do it. I have actually had people tell me, you can't do this that way, even though I'm doing it on a normal basis. When I say it, just fill the blank in. They're telling someone that is successfully accomplishing a task that it can't be done or they're doing it wrong. These people are unbelievable, man. They're sick in the head. Then you got the thinkers and the talkers. These are typically your toe dippers. They never make it to the deep end of the pool because they're more comfortable waiting in the shallow end. These people are the ones that always want to see how it goes. Usually, these people just test everything in life and always fall back to their comfort zone, regardless of what the task is or opportunity or business. Once an amount of resistance hits and they find themselves in a position where it's possible or it looks like they're going to fail, they retreat back quick. They don't take risk. They believe failing is wrong and they're terrified of it. They will avoid failing at all cost. In this business, the thinker is the one who constantly calls sales support or calls a sales director with a bunch of technical questions that have nothing to do with actually making an effort to get their first deal, right? They're the ones that create all sorts of obstacles that don't really matter and say that they're willing to start once they watch the training videos just a couple more times, then I'll be ready. They really subscribe to the school concept that studying, planning, and knowing what you're doing should equate to results in the real world rather than actually doing it. This is false. Your results are your qualifications in the real world. Not what you studied, not what you think you know. Your results are your qualifications. So do you want to know how to tell when you or anyone around you understand something? When you or them are living it. And when you have the results, that's it. Until then, you're just a student with an unproven concept. Stop talking about it and do it. As soon as this group starts talking and cold calling merchants, they realize everything they learned in the week spent studying didn't really equate to anything except for they don't have that same amount of excitement and fire they did when they first started. 
they find out it's more difficult than they originally thought. And the skills to sell this have nothing to do with understanding and having all the knowledge. Taking action, eventually leading to massive action, is the key to building confidence and momentum in this business from day one. Just get started. Average people, average levels of action. The word average makes me cringe because this is a very dangerous place to be in life. Why? Because it's comfortable. And comfortable makes it easy to stay stagnant. People like me thrive on growth. Staying stagnant, not a good thing. Average individuals make average, decent efforts. They typically apply themselves the minimum amount required to get the average results. They watch the clock to see if they put in the average work hours. They grade themselves on the amount of time they put in versus the results they get. The good news is if you're average and you put in results in this industry, you can still make it really big if you commit to the time. If you can go get results, even on an average level, time's going to pass anyways, and you can still make it very big in this business. It's just going to take a longer amount of time. Then you have the massive action takers, the people that live at a massive level. These are the people I love to work with. These are the people I can connect with and relate with. When you're on a massive action level, time doesn't matter here. Results do. That's all that matters. Once a task is accomplished, it's immediate on to the next thing. All right, what's next? They use one of the world's most powerful unseen forces that you want on your side. It's your best friend, Mo. It's momentum. They don't eat lunch after signing a deal. After signing a deal is when they take advantage of the positive momentum on their side and they go get more or at least try to. They don't leave the field because they have a couple deals at two o'clock in the afternoon. They go until the town is closed and then wish there was more doors open so they could go pitch with momentum. My favorite athlete of all time and one of my favorite stories of massive action and this level of commitment is Jerry Rice. It was said that after they won the Super Bowl in 1995, one day after that Super Bowl, Steve Young went down to the building to find Jerry Rice alone, by himself, running routes on the field, practicing. Wow, man. Wow. That is the mindset of someone who takes massive action and is in it for results. They's in it to win it. Some things just can't be learned by reading and listening. Some things must be learned by doing and repetitive, applicable action. Selling a cash discount is definitely one of those things. You can study overcoming rebuttals and bridge to close all you want, but the only real way to actually learn how to do this is getting in the trenches and practicing. People taking massive action are the ones that I love to work with. I want to work with the doers. Those who understand a moment of success is the moment needed to continue grinding, not take a break. This mentality is all that has ever made sense to me since the day I sold my motorcycle and sacrificed my Florida dream to go back to Seattle to learn how to do this business. Hell, it was long before that. Number one at Comcast wasn't because I did anything short of all-out massive action. I work on Saturdays when the rest of the office is taking a break. That's why I would win. The doers are the group of people who stop everything and say, I'm going to figure out how to sell the cash discount program and I'm going to succeed at this business no matter what. They are the short of death, I will succeed mentality. There is no plan B. Burn the ships, baby. The truth is there's no other business like merchant services where you, an average Joe, or any individual can take massive action and see results that could lead them to complete financial freedom simply through sheer hard work and determination. If you continue after this book to try to find another vehicle to get the same outcome, to own your life, and to create financial freedom, then you're probably looking for a scam. All right, we've all heard there's no way to get rich quick. Well, this isn't a get rich quick opportunity either. However, it is a pretty damn good vehicle to get financially free reasonably quick if you're a doer, if you're a massive action taker. So think about it. What if it took you three months to fully understand how to sell this product 
and another nine months to have enough residuals to pay all your bills. Is that worth it? I'm confident in saying that accomplishing that in a year is completely doable. Again, it's just math, right? There's no secret sauce. It just takes complete dedication. It takes being coachable, massive action, and quite literally, your favorite money pen and some paper are all that you need. You walk down the street with a pen and apps on paper and you can create financial freedom if you have the work ethic. Personally, all I ever needed to begin making sales immediately, whether it was Comcast or Merchant Services, is how much does it cost, what's the general idea of the program, and where do they sign? Now that may not be everyone out there, but it sure makes it a lot simpler. Trust me, you'll figure the rest out as needed. For now, especially if you're new, wouldn't it be nice to just get started earning some money and building a little momentum right out of the gate? You don't need to understand every detail to do that. You need to understand the basics that you're helping people and go to work. At least that's how I've always looked at it and that's how I've always gotten started. And I can confidently say the results have spoken for themselves every time. Chapter action steps. Take some time to reflect on the type of individual that you are. Be honest. Are you a thinker? Do you overthink things? Do you complicate them? Are you so analytical that you never get started? Consider specific examples from your life and reflect on them. Identify what your natural tendencies in life have been up to this point. Again, be honest. Do you dive all in or do you overthink it? And where are you right now at this moment with this vehicle and where do you want to be in life? I really want you to be open, honest, and transparent with yourself because this is the only way that you can grow to reach your full potential. If you're not a massive action taker, you can still do great things in this business. But if you are a massive action taker, the equation can be sped up significantly. Chapter seven, the level of certainty skill. Have you ever walked into a business and asked, you don't wanna buy anything from me, do you? Talking to people as if you assume they won't sign up or do business with you is extremely common and detrimental to you in the sales industry. If you have any sales experience, I guarantee that you have said this loud and clear without intending to. I'm sure the words have never come out of your mouth, obviously. But with body language, thoughts, and energy, I absolutely promise you've screamed it loud and clear. We all have on a bad day. I packed up my pregnant wife, pal, and dog from Daytona Beach and moved to Los Angeles within only one month of her moving here from Mexico. To top it off, we had just lost our first book of business. What that means is that we had lost all the residual income. The first three and a half years of me working my tail off in this industry were taken from us literally overnight and we were poor with just a small amount of savings. Our life consisted of sleeping on an air mattress, literally using cardboard boxes for tables and eating with Dollar Tree utensils. My mother-in-law had to buy us our pans and eventually an actual bed and a dining room table. We had nothing but this opportunity. At this point in my life, I wasn't even stressed about our future. With every bit of fiber within me, I can honestly tell you I was never stressed about our future because again, I was betting on me and I already knew what the outcome was gonna be. That outcome hadn't changed. I was just forced to restart. But this time, I was starting over with experience and also a family that I was now responsible for. I was never scared about it because everything from it's not a gamble chapter is true. Even to this day, that is my mentality. And no matter the circumstances, I know I'm going to win because I'm betting on me. Now, my wife, on the other hand, fresh up from Mexico, though she has always believed in me and continued to do so no matter the circumstances, I can say was more stressed about the circumstances. I can't blame her. She was pregnant, living in a new country, and we were financially broke with our first kid on the way. This is not something I would wish on anybody. Looking back, she's the most incredible person in the world for never doubting the long term of the abilities of this industry and of me to create our future 
as I promised her the first day that we met in Mexico. I told her I'd deliver a life of her dreams. I had to deliver. So here we are. We're living in a city with more doors to knock on than anywhere in America, contending with New York City. And there were some days I just didn't feel like getting up and going to work. If I didn't have that genuine, the, the just, I'm one of the best in the industry ump that day, then I wouldn't go out into the field until I found that zone. Well, if you can imagine trying to explain to a stressed out pregnant wife without a crib or anything for the baby that's on the way that I'm not going to work because I'm not in the zone, didn't go over so well. I remember explaining my mindset and rationalizing to her in the midst of her anger, listen, my business is not like your parents where customers just walk in the door and buy stuff. My business is all mental. It requires that I'm fully present in my mind. I have to be in my zone or I'm just wasting my time in the field and burning territory. Now that we're on a debate and arguing about it, I'm definitely not in the zone, so I'm definitely not going to work. I know this sounds really harsh, but in my world, this is real. I'd rather be really direct and just kill this whole situation about when I go to work and when I don't now rather than carry it on forever and have poor productivity because I'm in the field trying to prove something. Since those conversations, my wife fully understands how I operate and how this business operates and how mental it really is. Ultimately, this maximizes every day that I work. Every long sales trip that I go on or any period of time that I'm focused. In the end, all the sales trips and sacrifices are for results, nothing else. They're for getting apps. So jeopardizing the mindset that creates results is not allowed in my world. Back then, we would charge setup fees, and I told Pal, I'll be back with some furniture and a TV for us. Don't worry about it. The same day I told her that, I went out and signed up a furniture shop on Van Nuys Boulevard, if you're familiar with Los Angeles, and their setup fee I charged them was a cheap sofa and TV. I rebuilt our life the same way that I always have, which was getting to work. It's all about getting to work. If you're in a hole, the only way to dig your way out is get to work. The best salespeople thrive on mindset and emotions. One of my favorite authors, T. Harv Eckert, says your inner world reflects your outer world. What that means is that your results are a reflection of your inner beliefs and confidence. So if you're getting poor results, that's normally nothing more than a poor inner belief and confidence within you. As sales representatives, we transfer emotions. That's it. That's what you're doing when you're selling out there. The product and the company don't matter as much as you think they do. Okay, It's your emotions and ability to transfer them to your prospect that ultimately matters. And if your emotions are off and you're stressed out and upset about things or worrying about money, you're going to carry that with you and most likely burn territory. Over time, work on mastering getting yourself into that go mode quickly. This chapter is an excuse to not go to work. And even on those days that I would argue with pal and say, I'm not going today, time would pass. I'd get in the zone and trust me, I went out there and I made it happen. I just didn't go hit a door, stressed out, upset, angry, ever. So I guess this chapter is more about get yourself in go mode and learn how to do it quickly before you burn doors. You don't have to feel perfect to get started. Don't get me wrong here. Okay, once you get started, it won't take long to become confident and fluent in your pitch. And I call it getting the marbles out. The first couple doors are about getting the marbles out. But even before you hit that first door, Get your mind right. So let's focus on the importance of the level of certainty scale. So on a scale from one to 10, how certain are you? What's your level of certainty in the product, in yourself, and if you're going to make the sale? So level 10 means you believe the product is absolutely flawless. It's incredible. There's no doubt how much it's gonna help your prospects and fulfill your business owner's needs, right? What it is that they're looking for, it is going to fulfill it. There's no question about it. It is going to better their life and they can't live without it. They'd be nuts and completely unreasonable to not buy it for their own benefit, not for yours. So the test if you're at a level 10 is without hesitation, would you sell this product to your own family? 
If your family members own a retail business or restaurant, would you walk in the door and offer them the cash discount program under your current provider? On the other hand, level one is you think the product is awful. It doesn't work right. It's probably going to break. They're going to overcharge. You would strongly advise your family to stay away from a product if you were at a level one. So if you aren't at least at a level eight, you're selling the wrong service. Because sales is all mental. You are transferring enthusiasm. How can you be enthusiastic about something if you're not even at a level eight? And if you are at a level eight or nine, you still need to fill the gaps to raise your level to a 10. I encourage you, watch testimonial videos. We have a lot from EasyPay from both merchants and sales partners. Research the success of others. Both sales partners in this industry, what it's done for their life, and merchant testimonials, how it's helped them on their business. Read articles, read blogs, and research all the positives of your service. One of the things I noticed about the thinkers, the excuse makers, is they actually research the negatives. Okay, if you want to do that, why would you plant those seeds in your head? You're trying to get to a level 10. Find all the positives and focus on that. So what does it feel like to be certain? You know what it feels like, we all do. Think about a time in your life when you were certain. Maybe it was a test you were extremely prepared for in school, or a game you were so confident that your team was gonna win, whether you were watching them on TV or whether you were on that team. How about walking up to someone and asking them out on a date with full confidence that the answer was gonna be yes. Any time in your life you were certain, Feel that for a moment. What was your body language like? What was your posture? Were you, were you upright and strong or were you slumped over and hunched? Were your words loud and strong or were they soft and unsure? Was your mind focused on getting the results you wanted or focused on the outcome that you don't want? Take a second. Imagine me recording this audio. Do you think I'm sitting in a chair or do you think I'm standing up? Do you think my hands are in my pocket at the side or do you think my body language is at a level 10 as I'm recording it even though you can't see? This is why so many of you listening to me are actually walking in some doors saying, you don't want to buy from me, do you? Before you ever have a chance for them to make their decision or even know what you're offering. The first impression is number two of the five unbreakable fundamentals to selling the cash discount program. And I, I guarantee you, when you're at a level 10, the first impression is already working in your favor 100% of the time. Without exception, the person at level 10 is going to flourish and get more people interested than someone at a level one through nine. They're just walking in the door differently. They have a different vibe, energy, body language right out of the get-go. One of the most commonly asked questions, believe it or not, is what should I wear in the field? My answer is always whatever you feel best in, right? If you think casual wear is what makes you feel confident and at a level 10, then dress casually. If you're a suit and tie kind of person that makes you feel level 10 representing the cash discount program, then wear a full suit and tie. Understand that what you wear isn't necessarily what makes a potential client buy from you. Rather, what you wear simply affects your own level of certainty. So wear whatever gets you closer to a level 10 and rock it with confidence. Personally, I'm a chameleon. I wear whatever the norm is for the territory. If I'm working out in a small town of Nebraska, I'm not wearing khaki shorts and flip-flops, right? I'm wearing boots and jeans. But if I'm working the A1A down in Florida, I'm probably not going to be wearing boots and jeans. I'll probably go to khaki shorts, possibly flip-flops. Now that we understand how important your level of certainty is, we need to transfer it to the prospect. So what level are your prospects at? Well, we never really know that. You'll never actually know that number, at, especially at the beginning. But I do know that when you go in at a low level of certainty yourself, your first impression is very likely to start the conversation off with them at a one, two, or three, potentially one. You would be starting with an uphill battle every time. 
So when you walk in at a level 10 with your physical appearance, your energy, your vibe, your voice, they are certainly going to be starting off at a higher level of certainty in you long before they even hear a word out of your mouth or what you're offering. So once you're past the first impression, everything you do moving forward is now designed to increase their level of certainty as close to a level 10 as possible. You need to be intentional here. Everything you say, the tone in your voice, your body language, every document you pull out and show them, every time you tap the paper with your pen to get them to look at something, everything must be in a manner to increase certainty in you and the service. Make no mistake about this. Your prospect's certainty in you is far more important than anything else. They are buying the certainty you transfer into them through every action you made from the moment you walked in the door. Raise their certainty and then you go for the deal. Now I want to clarify, they don't need to be at a level 10 with you to sign up, but they should believe that a level 10 is possible in the future business that they plan on doing with you. So they could be at a level seven plus, that's probably the zone where they should be willing to try you out. It's time to go for the deal, ask them for business. From there, they should become a level 9 or 10 naturally as long as you're working with the right company that's not going to throw in extra fees, that has great service, that picks up the phone and does everything that they say they're going to do. If your billing department, customer service, tech support, and anything else the merchant needs is on par, their level of certainty is going to go up every time they make a phone call in if they ever need to. So you cannot fake your level of certainty, folks. If you truly do not believe in the company you represent, if you truly don't believe in the cash discount program and all the benefits that it brings to business owners, forget yourself for a second. If you don't believe that it is helping them or that the company you represent isn't delivering on your promises that you're making in the field, the business or the relationship won't work. So you need to make sure you find the right company to sell with so you can sleep at night with 110% certainty that you are being honest, ethical, and moral in the pursuit of building your business. Remember, you're the one out there making the promises and telling them what to expect. It needs to be met on the back end. So I fully understand all the above scenarios and have been there and done that in terms of leasing and contracts, but that was years ago in this industry, okay? The industry has changed over the last decade that I've been in it. Right? It is not in a business owner's best interest. And the reason why I set up Easy Pay for reps to be compensated very healthy without having to do things like leasing is because I need reps to believe in the product and the company so that when they make a deal, they know that the merchant's going to get exactly what they were told. And if they don't, they're never locked in. So if interested, make sure you compare it with Easy Pay's opportunity. Here, you never have to lease equipment. You never have to lock people into long-term commitments. This gives our sales partners confidence that we intend to deliver because we make residual income. We want accounts to stay with us forever. So by not locking them in and not making them pay anything up front, we intend on keeping that account. And you don't do that with no contract and not giving them what you promise. We are partnered with the best and know our merchants will stay with us because they love the service they get. And what they are told by you, the sales partner, is what they're going to get. Knowing your merchants are getting what they're told is everything in your level of certainty. If you care to verify this and are interested in checking out EasyPay, make one of your first stops the EasyPay Testimonial Library. It can be found on our website, www easypay.company our merchant testimonial library you can hear it from the horse's mouth chapter action steps make a list of the pros and cons of selling the cash discount program is it easier for you to find the positives and difficult to think of the negatives if it is then go out and sell it if you see negatives first and struggle to find the positives then this program may not be for you this pros and cons list is to encourage you to decide where you stand mentally as you're being honest about how you feel on the program. It's very important and I highly encourage you 
to do the same with the company that you're working with? Do you feel confident that you're working with an ethical company? Do you still have to do contracts? Do they still encourage leasing terminals or do merchants have to buy terminals in order to avoid contracts? And are you being compensated fairly without having to lock your merchants in to contracts and terminal leases? One of the things that I love and I'm most proud about with EasyPay is that our sales partners can make great commissions without locking people in and making merchants buy anything. Everybody gets to test drive us and it does not come out of your commissions. Check us out. Chapter 8. Stop hunting squirrels. They say it's easier to pull people up from the top than push them up from the bottom. I learned how much truth there is in this phrase on my first attempt at creating financial freedom via that first multi-level marketing. I spent a couple years of my life trying to lead people to a lifestyle that I had yet to create. The intention was good and pure, yet I hadn't actually done it myself. It's hard to put off helping others until you've taken care of yourself first, especially when you genuinely care about others. But it's, it's almost impossible. How can you help someone accomplish something that you haven't yourself? You know what's even harder for most people? is blocking out all the noise of the doubters while you're in the pursuit of building your business. Typically, the doubters will make the loudest noise when you're at your peak of excitement too. It seems like whenever you find something or a vehicle that can bring a life-changing impact to the world you live in, it's always the average and below average thinkers that want to discourage you right when you're at your peak of excitement. Most of the time, they try to disguise it as actually being helpful. They think they're trying to protect you from thinking too big and falling short into disappointment. In my experience, people will also get offended by your outspoken confidence that there's a better way, like a better life, if you will. They don't care what the vehicle is that you're pursuing or promoting. They seem to confuse your excitement about this fantastic future life that you're going to have as a direct threat or insult that their life sucks. Obviously, that's not the case you're trying to make, but by inviting others to grow and have a better life with you, some people just won't understand. Society has programmed people to not only accept the average, but fight for it, to defend it, and to take offense to people who point out there's anything more. The monkeys keep each other in line and keep marching to the beat of the drum. You may hear things like, you've changed. If changing is a threat or perceived as an insult to anyone, then good job, you're on the right track, and you've definitely identified someone who should not be inside your inner circle where you find motivation and encouragement. The idea is to change, if it's for the better, obviously. If that offends people, you have a serious decision to make. You can stay small to please others, or you can keep growing and block out the noise. I found out that most people would rather work a 9-to-5 and go to the same old bar with the same old people talking about the same stupid nothing rather than sacrifice their weekends and take actions and learn new skills and make the changes to laser focus on a brighter future. In the past, it used to bother me because I was trying to share what I considered the holy grail to freedom, yet nobody cared. Even worse, many were insulted by the general idea. Thankfully, as time has gone on, I've grown up and matured. By now, I see they don't mean anything by it any more than I meant to offend them. We just live in different paradigms. We have different views of the world and our abilities and our obligation to control our own outcomes. I already shared that I moved back to Seattle with Curtis to promote the new multi-level marketing we joined with the intention of recruiting all my family and friends to travel the world and make residual income together. Not a bad gig, right? Well, it took over a year to accept that strangers, for me at least, are easier to work with than the people that I knew. Strangers seem to listen respectfully and have some excitement while the people I knew and grew up with would just see little Joey with a pipe dream. So with this business, you will encounter two types of people that I want to encourage you to pay no mind to. They're the doubters and the energy thieves. They are not contributors. The first category is anyone unsupportive within your inner circle. As much as you would like everyone to be your cheerleader, if they're not, don't let it get to you. 
when people tell you things, and I've heard it plenty of times, why don't you get a normal job? Or you have so much more potential. Why are you doing door-to-door sales? They actually think they're trying to help you. So appreciate their intention that they're trying to help and just disregard it. If possible, minimize your conversations about your business with them. You see the vision. They see a job title. The two are not related. What I do suggest is surround yourself with supportive people. Others that are having success in the business. Others going through the same struggles as you that also have blind faith in the end result. The other group that you should pay no mind to is unsupportive merchants. Whether you're doing door-to-door or working this business on the phones, I am not one to make guarantees, but I can guarantee you that you will run into business owners that do not like what you have for absolutely no reason at all. There's actually a really good reason for it. If you YouTube the merchant sales cycle easy pay, you can check that lesson out. But the truth is, none of it's actually your fault. So if you encounter merchants who don't trust you, don't listen to your pitch or flat out push you out the door because you're a salesperson, pay it no mind. That's just part of playing the numbers game. The truth is, if you aren't running into that, you aren't talking to enough people. Shouldn't happen all the time, but occasionally, it should be happening if you're out there playing the numbers game. From the beginning of my sales career, I never expected to sign everybody up. That doesn't make any sense, regardless how good you are or your product. That would be like the equivalent of Tom Brady expecting to have zero incompletions every game. Obviously, that would be impossible and an expectation that he can't live up to. Nobody could. Yet so many sales reps have a really hard time and will tell me things like, why doesn't anybody want to sign up? With that language alone, I can tell them because you're trying to sign everyone up. The words everyone and anyone are poison. We can't generalize like that. The secret out there is that you're looking for the one that is interested and then focus on them. Disregard all the rest as part of the process to finding your one. I call these targets also known as potential merchants. Everything in between is just hunting. When I go elk hunting with my great friend Dustin up in Montana, we'll strap up our boots and put in 7 to 10 mile hikes per day in the pursuit of finding the right elk to fill the tag. In the pursuit of looking for these targets, we may run across tons of other animals. So do you think that we're out there getting upset if we see squirrels and raccoons and birds? I don't complain to Dustin. Why aren't these squirrels big bull elk so that we can shoot them? As silly as that sounds and would be, that's how a lot of people act about canvassing. Ladies and gentlemen, you're hunting out there. Yes, when you walk in the door, you should have the expectation that you're going to get the deal and be at a level 10 certainty of it. But as you go through your pitch and do the dance, you need to evaluate if they are a target or not. Do your rebuttals, and if they aren't a potential merchant, then keep moving on, right? Don't bitch that they're a squirrel when you're looking for elk. As you do this hundreds of times a month, you're going to naturally come across plenty of potential merchants. That's when you engage more and line up your sights, metaphorically speaking. Those are the ones you take the shot. It's when you get the moment and know they're a potential merchant that you need to have the number four and number five of the five unbreakable fundamentals mastered. All, and I mean 100% of your deals come from targets. They're the ones who are interested and want to discuss the potential of you being their service provider. We are trying to force people to listen to us here. That's not the goal. You're going to have very long, frustrating days if that is what you're doing. The right people that need your help are out there. Have blind faith in that. Keep moving forward and you will find them. You must hunt. By focusing on finding targets, it allows you to move quicker. Talk to more people and increase your odds. At the end, everything I'm sharing in this book comes down to increasing your odds. That's it. I'm not sharing things with you that work 100% of the time. These are things that increase your odds. Everything about this business is just math. 
So I want to help you increase the odds of that math equation. Once you shift your focus to finding targets and you're simply hunting, it actually allows you to have a lot more fun out there. It takes all the pressure off of you as you walk out of a door without the deal. It shifts the thought process from what did I do wrong or did I say something wrong to, well, I guess that wasn't the target I'm looking for. Next. It allows you to let it go as you walk out the door, laugh it off, and move on to find your next potential merchant. I would like to throw in there, have blind faith that every day there are potential merchants. I found that anywhere USA, I would get three to seven potentials a day. Anywhere USA. So if you're going out there and you're giving it your all, you're working at a massive action level, you should be getting three to seven targets and potential merchants per day. Those are the ones that you give your time and focus on. Those are the ones that you don't leave until you've got a decision made. Whatever it takes, when you find a target, engage. If they're not a potential merchant, you're just the messenger sharing the program. If they aren't interested, no sweat. God bless. Take care. See you later. A very important note here. When you have a great pitch or if you have the sales book that I provide to the right people, just about every door should at least hear what you have to offer. If you're going into 10 doors and only one of them allows you to share the details of the cash discount program, then you only hit one door. Those other nine don't count. You just wasted the time. You need to master being interesting and likable enough so that everyone you talk to at least hears the details and the words cash discount program. And we can eliminate those fees you every time you accept the card. If they hear that kind of information, if they fully understand it and have zero interest, then move on. They're not a target. Never forget, if you walk into 10 doors and only one lets you pitch, that's one door. There are a lot of things that I can do to help you, and I do that in my training and coaching programs to help you increase the number of doors you hit to the amount of pitches you get out. My sales book actually makes this effortless as long as you can avoid being awkward at your first impression. Chapter action steps. If you do not already, put together your perfect pitch that can be duplicated over and over again. What you do not want to do is wing it and have a hundred different pitches at a hundred different doors. That totally messes up your averages. The key is to have a duplicatable pitch and story. You don't ever go away from that story until they start asking questions and throwing rebuttals at you. At that point, you handle the rebuttal and then back to the story. It is always consistent. This will streamline your whole sales process and improve your odds significantly. Again, increase your odds. The trick is to find the right pitch that works and roll with it at every door. If you struggle with this, my pitch book would be perfect for you. It's the same every time you deliver it. I hope I get a chance to share that with you. Chapter 9, The Power of Why I was getting dropped off at the base of Squaw Valley Ski Resort as dawn was nearing. I said a prayer with my family in the car and opened the door to a very cold, brisk October morning in the Sierra Nevada mountains. As they drove away, I found myself freezing cold, staring up at the silhouette of the grand mountain peaks around me. The sun wasn't up yet. It was still difficult to fully grasp what I was looking at. I cannot overstate how cold it was in this moment. I found myself all alone below freezing temperatures in a very light long sleeve compression shirt with only a t-shirt over it. The only thing covering my legs were very thin compression pants, shorts, and knee-high compression socks. I wore professional OCR racing shoes and a camel pack on my back carrying the water and some snacks which would ultimately be my lifeline for the day. This was the event which I'd been training months for. It was my first ultra Spartan race, which is 30 plus miles and 60 obstacles. I was wondering if I had prepared enough. How could I really prepare enough for an ultra race in the Sierra Nevada mountains when I live in Florida where it's flat? 
The starting elevation of this race was 6,500 feet, and they had a 2,700-foot vertical climb, which I didn't find out till later that day. I'd be going up and down four different times. My training consists of zero elevation climbs because it literally doesn't exist where I live. It was below freezing, and all of my training was in the warm weather of southern Florida. I was in for one hell of a day for sure. Man, I don't know if I trained enough. After a quick stretch and a warm-up, mostly to get my blood flowing and the temperature up in my body, the sun had just barely started to illuminate the sky. I was really looking forward to the temperatures to go up once the sun was completely out, and it was almost go time. I've completed multiple Spartan races, so I'm no stranger to sitting at the starting line of the long race in front of me. But this one had a much different feel. And it had a lot smaller attendance. I was wondering, did everyone else sleep in past their alarms? Or was I really about to embark on something that was on a whole other level of pushing the limits that the average person wasn't prepared to sign up for? Ultimately, it didn't matter as the pre-race speech began, as they do at all Spartan races. Speaker, who am I? Racers, I am Spartan. Speaker, We are honored by your courage and commitment to excellence. But know this, through your mind, body, and spirit, you will all be put to the ultimate test. Will you chase glory on this day? Who am I? Racers, I am Spartan. Speaker, look at the Spartans on your right and left, for you will draw strength from them as they will draw strength from you. You will not fail them. Who am I? Racers, I am Spartan. Speaker, I bid you stand, sons and daughters of Sparta. Stand and fight. For today is the day you rise to glory. Not tomorrow. Not next week. Right here. Right now. Who am I? I am Spartan. Who am I? I am Spartan. Oh, oh, oh. As the racers take off towards glory, the very long day ahead begins. We begin the race and immediately start a climb that is completely vertical. Doubt begins to fill my mind in the first quarter mile. And I'm wondering, am I actually prepared? A few miles pass and we're still climbing vertically. It took a few more miles of hiking before we start reaching what looks like it might be the top of the mountain. The sun is now out and shining. However, It is still freezing cold and the wind is picking up. I don't even know if the temperature went up after the sun came out. The weather conditions quickly go to the back of my head as we peak the first mountaintop and I take advantage of the first decline of the day by beginning a jog. It was the first decline after miles of crawling straight up. It was nice to be going down for once. We hit clusters of obstacles. People are trying to go over these moving monkey bars. They're falling into the water. We're rolling around in the mud. The rocks are scratching our knees. We're still on the decline, and I'm trying to take in the breathtaking views that were overlooking Lake Tahoe all at the same time. That beautiful view is kind of what helped me keep my mind off of the pain I was already experiencing and for sure the struggles that encompass a Spartan race. I found myself mid-race all alone, crazy enough to voluntarily suffer in this Spartan race while simultaneously enjoying a beautiful view of Lake Tahoe. Kind of crazy, but it was incredible. After multiple miles winding down the mountain, knocking down obstacle after obstacle, I noticed the starting point where we began the day in the faint distance. At the bottom, kind of flattened out, we hit even more challenging obstacles before we began to climb a separate mountain peak. This second peak was much more challenging than the first. The first peak had little flat spots and almost flattened out for moments here and there where you could get quick relief and then it would climb again. The second peak was relentless. It was much steeper and there was fewer areas for rest. It seemed like each vertical stretch never ended. That must be the next peak up there, I would think to myself, as I looked as far as I could to what looked like it might be the top. 
I would think it was the top and I'd put my head down and plow to the farthest spot that I could see only to find out it was the bottom of the next peak as far as I could see. Rinse and repeat this for about the next 10 miles. It was relentless. The longest race I had done before this was 13.7 miles, the beast race I did with Danny. It was already well past 13.7 miles. My adrenaline has ceased and I began to feel my body aching, big time. Like everything in life, however, you just keep going. It was time to jog and make up some time as I descended down the second peak. As racers finally made it back to the bottom, they entered what's called the transition zone. This is the zone where racers can have lunch, restock on supplies, fuel their body with food, use the restroom, nurse and tape up any injuries, and whatever else they need to get done. Now this was my first ultra race, and I was completely unaware of the zone prior to this one. So I didn't realize the importance of the zone and how important it was going to be to refuel for the remainder of the race. I did not know or expect a transition zone, nor did I have any idea how critical it was. So I sat there for roughly five minutes and ate a small gel pack for lunch. I didn't bring sandwiches and I didn't bring full lunches like most other people I saw around me. I ate my gel pack and I kept moving. I didn't want to rest too much and let my muscles cool down, so I was quick and on the way. At the transition zone, we were already 18 miles and about 30 obstacles into this race, and we were starting all over again for a second lap, which was shortened down a little bit to a beast race, which is about 12 plus more miles. That's right, we were back up the peak again, but this time with 18 miles already under my joints and feet while running low on calories. How the heck was I going to pull this off? The Spartan community says you run the first half with your body, but you run the second half with your mind. This phrase could not be truer. The rest of the day from that transition zone would prove to be a battle of the mind as the body was already done. After climbing up 2,700 feet twice and descending it, it was time to dig deep and keep plowing. As I start heading up the first mountain peak for the second time, the comfort of the starting point where the live music, warmth, food, and bathrooms are is becoming further in the distance. As I'm battling these same physical obstacles and peaks for a second time, the mental battles in my head were very strong and very real. I wanted to quit. Many, many times, I wanted to quit. I was watching others quit and drop off of the race before my eyes, to my left and to my right. Not to mention, this was after the huge clusters of racers who dropped out while in the transition zone that never got back on the trail. The second I was about to cave in to my physical pain I was experiencing, it began to snow. My freezing, aching body wanted to quit even more as the snowflakes and cold snow fell on my skin and my hair literally just started clumping into ice. Okay, man, that's it. You can't do this, I said to myself. My mind could justify in every way why it was okay to quit. The body isn't designed to do this. You didn't prepare enough. It's not possible to prepare for something like this from Florida. Who cares what all the people you told you'd finish think? Screw all them. They're not here doing this. Not being able to finish doesn't make you a quitter. You're going to hurt yourself. There's always another race that you can be better prepared for. The thoughts and excuses were relentless and legit. After arguing back and forth with my inner self for about 30 to 60 minutes, I caught myself and I finally lasered in on why I would finish. I had my why. I had my strong why firmly in place and quitting was no longer going to be an option the rest of the day. I would no longer entertain the thought of quitting. In the meantime, during these mental battles, the storm was picking up and now it was starting to have lightning and thunder and snow and fog. I was running in a thunder snow lightning storm at the peak of a mountain in very light clothes. 
I was on my way down the first peak, the third one of the day, when a man in a truck pulled up and said, you got to get in. The weather's too severe. No way. I'm way too far in this race to stop now, I told him. You have to. There's a shelter on the top of the mountain. You don't have a choice. You have to get in. Is it warm in that truck? Yes. Yes, it is. With that, I jumped in, not knowing if that would be the end of the day or not. I was taken to the shelter, which was the top of the lift, and there was also a restaurant there. It wasn't open when we got there, but out the window, it was an incredible view of the Olympics Five Circles logo, if you can imagine, outside the window on the top of a mountain with a real nasty storm in the backdrop. It was kind of cool, actually. Racers either had to wait out the storm and finish the race, or after the storm cleared, ride the chairlift back down to the bottom of the mountain and end the race early. The chairlift was calling my name. The mind flooded with every reason why I should walk out and take the ride down after the storm passed. But I remembered my why, and those reasons became stronger than the aches and pains and the perfectly lined up excuse and free ride back to the bottom. I was not going to take the easy way out. No freaking way. During the 30 minutes of waiting for the storm to calm, I stretched here and there and I continued to walk around. I did not want my muscles to freeze up. I ran into a friend, Josh, who was a pacing partner I'd met earlier in the day, and he asked if I needed some fuel and offered me a Snickers. This moment could easily be a Snickers commercial because at this point, I was not myself and I was completely starving. To this day, I call this the Snickers that saved my life. I can't put into words how drained I was. I can't describe how easy it would have been to just quit. Just on the fact that I was at 0.001% in the tank would have been enough. I may owe this entire story to that Snickers refueling me back to what felt like 10%. Eventually, the lightning cleared and we began our journey again. As I fast forward, there's a couple more peaks. I'll fast forward past many more grueling obstacles and miles of this race where I finally came around the corner. I had a quarter mile to go in the same spot where I'd been dropped off that morning. I'll never forget hearing my why calling for me as I came up to the final three obstacles. Daddy, they shouted. The why I committed to was my family. I kept visualizing their proud and excited faces as they watched their Superman dad and husband finish the race strong. I was struggling, but refused to show it to my kids, and with every ounce of energy and strength left in me, I successfully completed the rolling monkey bars, the 400-pound tire flip, and the Spartan pyramid all while my kids and wife cheered me on to the finish line on a completely empty tick. Mission accomplished. I am an ultra Spartan. Ow, ow, ow. I've seen so many people quit that have what it takes to do this business. They never establish a strong enough why to weather any storm. Your why isn't just about motivation to get you going in the morning. It's far more important that it stops you from quitting when things get brutally hard, when you want to quit altogether. Being motivated doesn't last, and you don't feel it every day. Your why will keep you plowing forward with zero left in the tank, not motivation. Motivation comes and goes. Your why keeps you going. It's common for people to get excited about the opportunity in the beginning and they're determined to do this business. Then the race begins. They talk with a few business owners, find out this part of the race is uphill, quickly get this courage, and convince themselves they need more training. They turn back to the bottom where the food and warmth is to train more. The problem is, they never get back on the trail and move towards the finish line. It's easier at the bottom, and you have company. It's warm, you got restrooms, and lively music. It's lonely on the trail and at the top, so why struggle up that mountain again? When you first saw Merchant Services and the opportunity, what did you envision? Just making money? 
Was it about waking up Monday morning with no boss to answer to? You thinking about the vacations? Or maybe it's your spouse not having to work anymore. What is the one thing that would be worth anything to fulfill? It can be as simple as a smile on your kid's face. That's the thing that will stop you from turning back and quitting. Eventually, as you keep going, you're going to hit a point where the decline starts and you can feel some momentum helping you go at a faster speed with far less effort. It'll still be hard, but you'll have some momentum assisting you slightly. Becoming comfortable with the pitch that gets you through the five steps to a conversation, learning how to handle the common rebuttals, and transitioning smoothly to close deals is what I consider the first mountain. Mastering the five unbreakable fundamentals and getting good where they're unconscious is the first peak. Reaching the top of the first peak is when all the hard work and the steep incline becomes worth it. Because now you're cruising, you can take a moment to stop and enjoy the view. This is the reward of signing deals consistently. When you peak the first mountain peak in this business, you can now sign deals consistently just by going to work. It's a beautiful thing and a great feeling. You conquered a peak. The downhill is when you find out you can do this on excitement alone and it helps you get more deals. You're working on building your foundation. It's not easy by any means, but you have momentum and it's easier than when you started. The second peak is when you start perfecting and becoming more confident with your approach and pitch. You are no longer a rookie running on the thrill of being new and fearless. The second peak, everyone I know that has made it in this business experienced. And it's where the people that start hot quit. The second peak can be short-lived or it can be a long one. Or you could quit. But every successful rep I've ever met experienced it. It's when the high of your first push of success in this business goes from fun to this is now work again. Usually you go through a small, doesn't have to be big, but a small slump. Many people give up on the second peak because they don't want to put in the hard work to find their stride again. They've mentally got out of that zone and are struggling to find it. So they give up. Thankfully for you, we're talking about selling the cash discount program and not completing an ultra race. To get off the second peak, you have to apply what I often talk about, which is get back to the fundamentals. Stop being fancy and adding little tweaks and little cool stuff into your approach. We all do it. Catch yourself. Get your mind back to when you were genuinely excited about the business. Find your why power and make it fun again. That's how we get off the second peak. Get back to the fundamentals and start having fun again. Running on a decline versus slowly crawling up the peaks are directly related to your genuine level of excitement and belief in both your sales ability and the service you're helping your merchants with. This is how you keep yourself on the decline with momentum versus an uphill battle struggling against outside forces. You must be genuinely excited and you must stick to the fundamentals. You cannot fake this part. The transition zone is critical and it's my favorite part of this business. You must refuel and reward yourself. The transition zone is the benchmarks you set and the reward of hitting them. These can be vacations, they can be special dinner nights, they could be date nights with your spouse, a day of golf, whatever it is that's special and is a reward for you, do it. Embrace the transition zone in order to come back stronger. Whatever the reward looks like in your world, give them to yourself and whoever is supporting you. It's okay to take a break and soak in your accomplishments. Life is too short and this is tough. So remember, please reward yourself. Long term, you will be much farther ahead if you reward yourself. And it's more enjoyable. If you can pass these two peaks, which are the ability to successfully close sales and the ability to identify when you're off the basics and get your mind to where it needs to be, then the world will be yours. You are now a professional in this industry and you now control 
whether you are on an incline or a decline. At this point, your biggest hurdle is your mind, your drive, your determination, and your work ethic. And you've got to be honest with yourself so you can catch yourself when you're off track. All of this can easily be refueled with a strong why. It needs to be so strong that it would take death to stop you before you kept pushing on. Remember, this isn't nearly as hard as an ultra race. There are really hard tasks in life, but learning how to sell a service that will bring you and your family complete freedom while helping people isn't that hard. You may encounter natural learning curves within this business. You should not have to go through this process alone. I offer the tools and training to help you continue to climb the mountain of cash discounting. I invite you to plug in if you're a serious type of person that wants to do this. If you're not, don't waste my time. Whether it's me or someone else, there's plenty of people in the business that have already climbed the mountain and know how to successfully build a book of business selling the cash discount program. I encourage everyone reading this to have a clear vision of the future you're working for because there will come a day that you want to quit. Remember, your future is non-negotiable. It's already yours. All you have to do is continue to put in the work. Lock that future in your mind and stick to your action plans. If it gets tough, don't quit. Find your metaphorical snickers to keep you back on track and refuel you towards the finish line. Whether it is coaching, practicing, or changing your sales pitch because you got off the basics. Remember, you only lose if you quit. With a strong enough why, it is impossible to do anything but succeed. I want to share a story here of, of, of a friend. His name is Cole. He's the best example I know that I can, I can compare this business to an ultra Spartan race. I met Cole in Spokane, Washington when I was learning the ropes of this business myself. And Cole was not, you know, the sales guy that got a ton of deals. He was never the top producer. In fact, I'll be honest. I didn't think he would make it in this business. Not because he didn't want it or didn't have the work ethic, because I didn't think he'd be able to financially keep his head above water long enough for his math equation to catch up and for residuals to pay his bills automatically. He wasn't signing enough deals himself to actually pay the bills, or at least I didn't think. But I was wrong. Cole continued putting in three to seven deals a month for years. Think about that. There were months that he would only put in like three four or maybe five deals, but he kept plowing. Cole moved to Nashville and some years went by before I ran into him again. Along with many others from the first organization, we came up together. We crossed paths in Las Vegas at a convention. And I got to tell you, I couldn't have been more proud to find out that he was still very actively putting in the same three to seven apps per month. With the few people I feel really close with in this business, sometimes I'll ask how their residuals are. I mean, I got to be close. That's, a, that's not something I typically will ask. But with Cole, I was just curious. I, I had to know. Let's just say he is one of the many I mentioned earlier in the book that is abundantly financially free because he was loyal to this game. Those three to seven deals per month over the years added up big time to more than I could have ever imagined when I first evaluated whether I thought he'd succeed or not. Folks, this business will set you free. This is not bias. This is not my opinion. It is a fact. So please do yourself a favor and find a why so powerful, a result that's worth whatever it costs so that you can beat your mind when the time comes and you find every excuse in the book why it's okay to quit. It's not okay to quit once you know better. Don't be the one who beats yourself in your own mind and robs your future self of that feeling that Cole feels every month when that residual deposit hits, knowing that he beat his mind and is now free the rest of his days. Chapter action steps. Create a vision board or decorate an area of your home that you visit every day, such as your bathroom mirror. Set your intention each day. Plant the seeds in your mind of the outcome far ahead of time. Think about it often. Become 
obsessed with the outcome. Adopt the mind of a child and imagine that life without fear, without the judgment, and without asking for permission. Like all things in life, your drive is going to go up and down. That's why you cannot rely on motivation. You may not always wake up excited to get yourself in the field to build this business. That is when your ability to imagine and visualize as a child will get you going. Fortunately, unlike a child, you understand that in order to create a reality from your imagination, it's time to get your ass up, get your mind right, and get out there and go help somebody today. Your actions determine your reality. Never forget the power of why. Chapter 10, Your Circle of Influence. Quote, if you want to soar with the eagles, don't hang with the ducks. Unquote, unknown. They say you become who you surround yourself with and spend the most time with. Do you agree with that? If you look at the five people inside your financial and professional circle of influence, are you on the same path as or taking similar outlooks on life as most of them? I'm going to say most likely, yes. Do any of the people in your financial and professional circle of influence talk highly about their job and the big increase and the big raise they're hoping to get while the rest of the circle is excited because business is booming and they're spending less time at work as profits keep increasing? Probably not. For average people in today's world, it's easy to find others who think like a college-educated monkey. Get in line and wait for a check on Friday and permission to take time off. The employee mindset of a J-O-B, just over broke. Finding the right people and entrepreneurs that are willing to be in your circle, coach and support you are a little more hidden than the employee mindset. You have to find them. You have to go out of your way usually because they're not hanging out in the same places and spaces as average people. But once you focus on finding them and intend on surrounding yourself with them, they will show themselves. They're out there. You must find them and plug in with them. Be intentional about who you allow in your inner circle. Have you ever seen Michael Jordan practice football with Jerry Rice mid-basketball season? How about Jerry Rice practicing baseball mid-football season with Ken Griffey Jr.? No, of course not. That wouldn't lift them up within their own circle of influence within their specific sport. Yet those same people may be perfect for another circle of influence, such as health or mindset. Though they play different sports, and advice on catching the ball while sprinting full speed may not be MJ's advice that he should be giving to Jerry Rice, maybe a tip on controlling your mind under circumstances of pressure in a game-winning situation is something that MJ could share with Jerry Rice. They can be in circles of influence, but definitely not within the same professional and financial one. They are in different categories. The main four circle of influences are number one, financial and professional. Number two, health and mindset. Number three, relationships and parenting. And number four, religion or spiritual. When I say work for a season of your life and encourage you to find a strong circle of influence, Obviously, I'm talking about your financial and professional circle. Naturally, when you're focused on building a cash discount portfolio, you should not be taking advice from your best friend Josh if he's the manager down at the bank on how to effectively build your 1099 sales business. Josh may be perfect and contribute tips on other circles of influence, but based on where he gets his paycheck, this clearly would be a poor choice to allow in your financial and professional circle of influence if you are laser focused on building a payment processing business. Keep that in mind if you find yourself taking advice from others. Even if they're your friends, even if they're your family, are they the influence and do they have the results that you want to mirror? Always ask yourself that. If the answer is no, just be aware and adjust accordingly who you take your advice from. Of all the people in the world, I only have one person who I would consider inside all my circles of influence. There is only one person that has been right there helping navigate and plan this whole journey. There are many supporters, sure, 
but I'm referring to the one person inside the actual process and actions and decisions being made throughout the journey of building this business and building this life. I couldn't do what I do without my wife, pal. She's not only on the inside of the circle of influence, she is my source of support and encouragement. There is no one that has been as influential in succeeding in this business more than pal. When we were broke, she supported sticking to the plan and pushing through the suck. When we aren't sure of an outcome but know the risk versus reward may get us what we want, with no guarantees, who encouraged me to go for it? Pow does. When the rest of the world doesn't understand, and she probably doesn't either, but still says go for it, that's my wife, Pow Wagner. I'm talking about the kind of blind support that even when the big picture isn't realistic, or may seem impossible, but still says go for it because they believe in you more than anything else, including their own reasoning, that's the kind of support we all need and we need to be for others. To me, she is the example of who you want in your inner circle. The point of these circles of influence is one advice, two support, and three accountability. That's it. Advice, support, and accountability. Number one, advice. The advice is optional to us whether we choose to accept it or not, okay? You don't have to take it. Just because someone sees different options and point of views doesn't always mean that you're required to follow it. They're there for you to get an outside look. They give you advice looking from the outside in and it's up to us to agree and apply it or to disagree and disregard it. Or maybe we just take the bits and pieces that we wanna use and then disregard the rest. But at the end, our circle is providing different perspectives to us that we can respect because they are coming from a place of experience and taking a different view than what we're seeing. This is super critical. Do not take advice from people that are not doing what they advise you to do. Number two, support. Having someone for support through this Hard work is like getting home from a, a long day of traveling. I don't know if anyone listening has had long days, you've had delays, maybe multiple flights, and eventually you get back to your house after a long day. You get back in that bed and you just kind of have that, oh, it's so good to be home moment. That's kind of what support is like in this business. Now, I don't make promises in this business. I certainly don't make guarantees in anything but myself. But I can promise you this, if you work in direct sales, you're going to have these long days. Some days are going to be more challenging than others for a multitude of reasons. One of those challenges is your own mental attitude, believe it or not. And keeping it strong and positive and having a strong mind is actually pretty exhausting when you're doing it all day long. So after you've had a long day in the field, you've kept a great attitude, you're at a level 10 on the certainty scale. And then you don't get as many deals or maybe you got none for that day and you walk in your house pooped. There's nothing like connecting with your support. You can connect in person. If it's not a spouse or someone that lives with you, then do it over the phone. Preferably in person or over the phone. Email can be helpful, but you know that that's not a real connection. I'm talking about having a connection with somebody after a long day. But whatever you have, even if it is only email, Use it. That's fine too. Pal has always been this support mechanism for me. And though I'm very mentally strong, eventually, no matter who you are, you would break down at some point without a strong support in place that you can vent and share the hardships and struggles with. Pal always listens with a, it's all good and tomorrow you will be stronger than today attitude. Her support is never one of pity or maybe this just isn't for you. Never. That would not be the support that you're looking for, and it's not the support that I get on my end. If someone is telling me, maybe this isn't for you, and giving me an out, that is not someone that is strong enough that I want in my inner circle. I need people that will tell me straight and push me. Now, obviously, having a matching vision of the direction you're going is critical if your spouse is your support contact. Pal's the kind of person who, if I ever had a discussion with her about quitting the merchant service business and for the record we've never had that conversation and if we ever did she would not give me the support to sacrifice the big picture 
because she gets it too. Get aligned with your support team and if they know how important the big picture really is and if they're your real friends, then giving up won't be something that they would advise you to do. Number three, accountability to somebody is huge. It's too dang easy to come home from lunch after making a couple of contacts on the first half of the day and then not get going back in the field because it's just easy to find yourself doing activities at home or wherever you are versus getting back out and chasing productivity during work hours. This is a critical lesson I hope that you listen to of activity versus productivity. Again, you can find it on YouTube, activity versus productivity, easy pay. You must be productive and having a support in place to hold you to the flame of it is crucial. Do not justify your efforts of activity when it's productivity time. Listen to the lesson if you don't understand what I'm saying. Many times I'd be on the road hundreds of miles away from my family and I'd remind myself that I must come home with results. I have to perform all the fundamentals at level 10 and keep grinding or else I'm shortchanging the very people that I'm doing this for. In the end, nothing is stronger than having the support of people you respect highly. Share your why with the most influential people in your life. Let them know the journey you're on and remove people from being inside your circle of influence if they are not contributing. The whole circle works together and everyone within it must contribute. Your circle of influences are not a one-way road either. People are there to help you and you are there to help others in the categories that you are fit to do as well. You may not realize it, but you're probably in someone's circle of influence already. If you acknowledge it, cherish that. You are part of someone's life at a level that you're obligated to be direct, be truthful, and be supportive. Good friends may tell you what you want to hear more often than not, but anyone with your best interests in mind will not tell you what you want to hear. Without hesitation, they will tell you what you need to hear. They will call out your BS and help redirect you if necessary. Those are the people you want in your circle. The ones who will challenge you and make you uncomfortable if it's necessary. These people, if they say you're on track and doing great, they mean it. Good job. Chapter Action Steps Who's in your circle of influence for all four categories? I encourage you to find some online groups of people who are doing what you want to do. Again, make sure you're listening to people that are doing it, have done it, and are helping others do it. Join our Facebook group and others in the industry and plug into some networking and training classes. And invest in yourself by taking time to link up with the right types of coaches and people only with results. And fill your circle of influence with people that can push you in the right direction. Chapter 11, The Worst Advice in History I've mentioned in this book a couple times that I'm a father of three. As I'm recording this, I have two boys and I have one little girl. Anyone who's a parent knows that children are constantly growing and rapidly changing. It's a natural course that obviously can't be stopped. And when you think about it, it's really the purest form to desire and grow and proves that we should never stop learning. Children are in a state of what I believe we are meant to be in our whole entire lives. They don't care what others think about them failing. Can you imagine a baby trying to learn how to walk and feeling judged for falling down and then spending the rest of their lives trying to avoid people ever seeing them fail again? Of course not. They don't give up. They get up and they do it again until they master it. That's how they learn everything. Kids look at everything with curiosity and belief. They see bigger kids do something and they want to do it too. They don't overexamine how they're going to do it. They don't plant seeds of doubt that they're not capable of, of whatever it is they want to do. They literally visualize themselves doing it and simply try. Children naturally know how to visualize with blind faith. They also know how to pretend to the extent of creating a paradigm around them that reflects an imaginary place and world, even characters. Doubt doesn't naturally creep into a child's thought process until later in life when the world and parents have been telling them, no, 
and be careful. That's all programmed into them through the course of their life. Children naturally believe that they can and that they will. They aren't aware that they cannot do what their imagination tells them to do. It's really powerful when you think about it. Children also go through various phases and their interests change, sometimes seamlessly overnight. One day they're into Mickey Mouse, then they're on to Paw Patrol, then it's PJ Masks, Ninja Turtles, then they grow up and they're on to things like Avengers, and then they spend less time with toys and want to go biking. Then they decide to try skateboarding. It's always changing, it's always evolving, and they get experience with lots of different things. I doubt anyone listening to this book is still as obsessed about a certain show, character, or toy as you were when you were a child. You outgrew it, right? We all do. Things change. Our interest changed. Now, I've noticed, at least with my kids, that their favorite sport changes with the season as well. If it's football season, that's the sport that my son wants to play when he grows up. But when football season wraps up and it becomes soccer season, guess what? All of a sudden, soccer is his favorite sport. The reason I give these examples is just to note that infants and children and kids, they're never stagnant. They try new things without fear of judgment. They get better by practicing and changing what doesn't work. And they don't ask for permission to become better. They just do it naturally. They know what they like. They know what they want. And they can visualize it. And it drives them. I don't know about you, but when my kids want something, they're relentless about it. They are persistent. They'll keep asking. And they want it. Eventually, they normally earn it. For example, my daughter has had her mindset on the Barbie dollhouse since October. Christmas was coming up. My wife and I have told her, Maybe Santa will get it for you if you behave. Between October and December 25th is the time of the pursuit for her. That's the time of waiting and being excited about the thrill of possibly getting the toy that she she wants. And it drives and it motivates her. She talks about it every day. It creates energy in her. It's the thrill of wanting something you don't have that makes it so desirable. And it's only natural to be emotionally attached to the thrill with the pursuit of the things that you're pursuing. I think people without this drive enjoy staying in their comfort zone. They don't have something that keeps that excitement every day of their life towards something they want to obtain. Now this Barbie Dreamhouse example isn't supposed to illustrate by any means that fulfilling my daughter or anyone's happiness should be fulfilled through things but it is to acknowledge the hunt. It's to acknowledge the pursuit and the benefits of being in the pursuit. The journey that comes along with being in the pursuit of fulfillment, whether that fulfillment comes in the form of something material, helping others, or even spending time with certain people, is a huge motivational factor. Whatever it is, we're designed to be in the hunt at all times. People that live in a level of massive action are always in the pursuit of something. People who don't feel this drive to be on the hunt, I think have probably settled for average and convinced herself it's okay to live in your comfort zone. The world tells them, just be happy with what you have. Don't get greedy. It's not acceptable for me or others around me to live in a life of being comfortable. And since you've made it this far in this book, my guess is that you're probably on the same page. Now let's talk about the worst advice ever given in the history of the world, which is do what you love. If you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. You should choose what you love as your career. What a bunch of BS, man. This advice is unbelievably flawed. It's based on the fact that society is giving 18 to 24 year old young adults this advice based on the concept That what they love now is what they're going to love until they're 67 and a half years old and when they can retire. What a load of garbage. Do you still love what you loved when you were a kid? Are you still as obsessed about Ninja Turtles as I was in the 90s? Of course not. You outgrow it. And the things that you love and are passionate about and hobbies change. Have you ever heard a story similar to this one? A lady that loves pies. 
She loves making them. All of her friends love her pies. She gets so much gratification from the satisfaction it brings to anyone that she bakes a pie for. She loves the process of baking them. It actually brings her back wonderful memories with her grandma in the kitchen when her grandma taught her how to bake the pies and it was their time to bond. Everything about pies brings her satisfaction and good memories. So naturally, everyone boasts about her product and say, hey, why don't you open a pie shop? These are unbelievable. She remembers, hey, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life advice. So what the heck? It'd kind of be dumb not to open a pie shop, right? Wrong. Within 12 months, she despises making pies. She hates getting into her shop at 4 in the morning to start the prep work. But guess what? She doesn't have a choice. She has overhead to pay, and since she quit her job to start the pie business, the pies are what pay the mortgage and all her other life expenses. She's actually working twice as much for less pay, too. She has turned from using baking pies as a hobby that she loved to build in her own financial prison that requires her to work in her own pie prison. And that, my friends, killed her love for pies. Let's think about this another way. If your favorite food is bacon-wrapped scallops like me, you'd be happy to eat them for breakfast, lunch, and dinner six days a week until you're 67 and a half, right? Probably not. The idea that you're supposed to pick what you love so much that you'll do it forever is just absurd. Your passions change as your journey through life continues. And too much of anything is not good. The day you make doing what you love a requirement and the source of paying the bills is the day you will slowly lose the passion for it. Now, maybe this isn't immediate. It may not happen overnight, but at some point, If you're going to do the same thing for 30 to 50 years, it will catch up and that love will eventually turn into resentment. Nobody loves chores. And if you make a hobby or something you love, the only way that you pay your bills, it becomes a chore. It becomes a job. As all things in life, there are exceptions. I would imagine saving people's lives would go up there with not ever getting old. But you get the point. This is why I'm obsessed with this business. One thing that I know for sure is that you will know what you love and don't love the day that you have enough cash flow coming in that you get to choose what you want to do every day of your life. I'm all about doing what you love. That's actually the whole point of this business to own your life. I just know that what you love changes too. But with cash flow, you can do whatever you love in the moment today, and in the next moment when what you desire has changed, you can do that too. You can go with whatever it is that you love. You can always do what you love and it won't be the same your whole life because of cash flow, because of residual income. I'll have similar conversations like this on some webinars or with groups and there's always a few people who are offended, right? Always, right? But I love being in the whatever industry they're in. It's my passion. Even if I had financial freedom, I'd still do it. My response is always the same. That's awesome that you love what you do. Let's create some financial freedom and really put that to the test. You know, if you love being a pharmacist and say that if I had complete financial freedom, I'd still do it. Perfect. That is awesome you love your job that much. Let's create financial freedom and test it. I want people to truly love their life and to be able to contribute to society and to be able to give their attention and time to whatever it is that they love to do. If that's go to work, then choose to do that once you're financially free. Perfect. I'll believe you when you do it by choice and don't have to take the money. That is exactly why my advice to society is not do what you love, but do whatever it takes to be free so you can truly pursue the things you love. Had Anthony Smith called me and said, hey Joe, what's going on man? I've got a gig that's gonna create financial freedom for you in three years, guaranteed. The next three years, we'll be working at a horse track. We're gonna be picking up horse crap six days a week. But for every pile of manure you scoop up, you're gonna make $1 per month forever. 
are you in? I'm sure I would have replied with something like, are you kidding me? I'll be financially free in three years. Let's get started. Can, is there any way that we can make these horses crap faster and more? I didn't jump on board because I love credit card processing. I started because my vision sees years ahead and this is just a math equation. I joined because of the end result, owning my life. What I would not respond with is, are you serious, Smith? I don't like picking up horse crap. I ain't gonna do that for three years. I'm gonna go off and I'm gonna be a bartender and wait tables for the next 40 years till I'm 67 and a half because I don't wanna do that for three. Are you kidding me? I'd do anything for three years if it saved me 40 years of my life and I could have the funds to live how I wanted to on top of the time that it saved me. Seriously, who cares how you get it done? If you don't love the acts necessary to own your life, then I suggest you lie to yourself, fake it till you make it, do whatever you must, but keep plowing and getting results because you're gonna own your life in the end and the work aspect of it won't have mattered. Focus on the result, not the act. Listen, Fortunately, I happen to love helping people, and that's how I've always looked at direct sales. I love sales. Whether it's on the phone setting appointments or doing door-to-door, -door, I have always loved sales. Even as a Comcast sales rep, I was helping people put money in their pocket and receive more for their money. I've always felt like I'm bringing value to people. I could never have been successful if I didn't feel that way. So for me, I've always loved what I do, fortunately. If I looked at my role in merchant services as I'm just this low life door to door salesman, I'm walking in and bothering people who didn't ask me to share my services, then of course that wouldn't be fulfilling. But here's my thought process. Because of this vehicle and because I know that it's the only one that someone could go out and put in work and get financial freedom like that, I'd still do it. I am willing to do whatever it takes for the outcome of freedom. As long as it's legal, moral, and ethical, I'm in. I have zero reluctance to do what I may not feel like or love in the moment if it ensures that I can be free to do what I love with my family and loved ones the rest of my life. I'm really trying to make this point here. I hope that you're getting it. If doing what you love makes you a slave to having to earn money the rest of your life, then that's a trap. That is horrible advice. I'd rather just tell you, do something you don't absolutely love, but you're able to get results and give it a couple of years and you'll be free to do whatever you want the rest of your life. That's good advice. I would prefer to enjoy the journey, obviously. I don't want you to hate the journey. And like I said, I love helping people. But there were plenty of chapters in my merchant service journey. I didn't quite feel like it. And I wasn't at level 10 about enjoying the grind as I walk down the street. I happen to love what I do, but there's days that I didn't. There were countless mornings I woke up in a cheap, you know, roach motel room away from my family when I dreaded knowing that the grind was ahead of me. But guess what? I got my ass out of the bed because I obtained a skill and have mastered and encourage you to work on beating your mind as well. When your mind begins to focus on what you don't enjoy, remove those thoughts. As soon as you notice them, remove them. And you need to consciously replace them with the feeling of the reward, with that feeling of the vision of owning your life. Don't focus on the task if that bothers you. Focus on the reward and get your ass moving. This takes effort at first, but after long enough, it will become automatic. You will start catching your negative thoughts, canceling them out, and replacing them with positive thoughts and the vision of the future that drive you forward, not slow you down. All of this grinding to lay the foundation, it's just a temporary season of your life anyways. You give a small section of your life and put your nose to the grindstone. Go all in, be relentless, become obsessed with getting the next deal and when you do this for the season of your life in this vehicle, you can begin the next chapter of your life 30 years ahead of the rest of society where you're living based on choices rather than necessity. This idea is what I'm referring to when I say own your life. This is something that society 
most of society will never have that feeling. Even the ones that commit to a company and work till they're 67 and a half years old, when they retire, many of them will still be on social security living on a small amount of money. They might not have to work for that money to come in anymore, but they're still not living lavishly doing all the things that they love. And God forbid by that age, they don't have the health to do the things that they love to do. With this vehicle, if you commit a season of your life, don't follow the worst advice in the world and think about loving everything that you do. Do whatever it takes to get the results of residual income and then you can do whatever it is you want to do in your life. That's the best advice in the world. If you want to do what you love, then do whatever it takes to make the residual income so you can do what you love the rest of your life. Chapter 12, The Greatest Investment. Growing up Seattle and now living in South Florida, there's one thing that I struggle to find but absolutely love. It's pho, the Vietnamese soup for those who aren't familiar with what that is. In Seattle, you can find great pho restaurants effortlessly. You just drive down any main road, keep your eyes open, and it won't take you more than 5 to 10 minutes to find a great pho restaurant. And they're all good too. But after moving to Boca Raton, I searched around and I only found one in the area. Just one. Long story short, I went there and it was not what I was looking for. It was not the authentic Vietnamese restaurants that I'm used to up in Seattle. But I can't say I was surprised being in South Florida. But after about a year of living here, another one opened and it was within one mile of where we still live. So we went there, we tried it, and it was a slam dunk. Apparently, I wasn't the only one thrilled they opened because right out of the gate, they have always been extremely busy. Even four years after they've opened, as I'm reading this, they're always busy down there. Now, in our family, we love to try all sorts of different things, but when we find a restaurant that we really love, we're pretty frequent customers, so naturally, we got close with the owners. We are on a first-name basis. They know our kids. And we just love spending time down there because we, we sit and talk with the owners and have an actual relationship. Plus, it's delicious. Well, because of the success of this location, after three years, they decided they wanted to open a second faux restaurant here in Boca Raton. We were thrilled for them and we figured it would be a great success as well. So they began that process. As we continued going for our normal lunches and dinners down there, We'd constantly ask, hey, how's that second location coming along? It was taking forever, and their response month after month was, we're waiting for permits for this, or we're waiting for the city for that. Month after month, this was the response that we always kept getting. The whole process was completely out of their control, and don't forget, they were paying for the lease during this whole process, waiting for outside forces that they had no control of to do what they needed to do. After almost a year, they finally got all their permits in order and opened up the second location. Naturally, as we continued to eat at ours, which because it's close to our house, we'd ask, how's the new location going? The response has always been, it's gone slow. From the very beginning, the second location was not having the same success as the first one. To fast forward this story, we were eating lunch there last week, and as usual, we asked, hey, how's everything going down at the second location? Emily, who's the owner, told me they were shutting it down, that they were still paying the lease, and in total, I didn't even ask this, but she, she threw it out there, that in total, they had lost over $300,000 in this process. Keep in mind, to this day, they are still paying for that second lease until they hopefully find someone that will take it over. Wow. $300,000 later and still stuck. This is one of many, many times that I hear or evaluate how others earn money or invest. And I tell my wife, pal, I love our business so much. When we left the faux restaurant after she had told us that they lost $300,000 and were still stuck in the lease, it was just another moment where I looked at pal and said, I can't believe how great our business is. I'm not kidding when I tell you with every fiber in my body that the merchant services and the payment processing business is the best that exists. In the normal world, there's a tremendous amount of risk when you're a business owner. 
And so much of it is out of the owner or the investor's control. So much of the success is based on factors that you don't control. It's crazy. There's so much expenses and overhead. There's so much management and time-consuming tasks. You've got to deal with employees. You've got to deal with scheduling. You got, you know, they got sick days. They don't show up for their shift. You've got to deal with inventory. You're talking permits. And you're waiting on the city. You get, you know, how long that's going to take. You have to rely on customers actually coming in. You've got to have marketing to keep them coming in. You've got upkeep, and it goes on and on and on of the laundry list of things that you have to do, many of them out of your own control. Not to mention that the average, not all, but the average business owner is consumed with the amount of time that they're spending inside their own business because they have to handle the tasks that are business related to keep it running. The average business owner spends well over the normal employee's standard 40 hours a week operating and running their business. I want to throw it out there because this is super important to me that I grew up in the sign shop. I watched my mom work well over 100 hours a week, painting billboards and silk screening. I remember being down at the sign shop till 2 in the morning to help mom complete jobs that needed to get done in order to get the check to make ends meet. So I have nothing but a huge level of respect for small business owners and in no way trying to demean the the small business owner that has to spend most of their life there to make ends meet. My mom is my hero in terms of work ethic. So don't misunderstand my angle and perspective on small business owners having to put in that amount of time. I give them nothing but credit from doing what it takes to make ends meet. I'm simply pointing out facts here. So why is payment processing the greatest business in America? Remember, it's all just math. So let's examine that. I've always taken road trips and ran offices when it comes to payment processing. The first road trip that I took to go test the cash discount program, I went on a road trip and worked for eight days. I signed 15 deals, including the very first door I ever hit. And I wanted to calculate what my residuals from that trip were going to be. They were over $2,000. I got a couple monster accounts, I must admit, on my first road trip. So my first trip in eight days, signing 15 deals, we had a $2,000 residual bump. Let's just say when I saw the first residual deposit, I went all in on cash discounting. All other projects in our world came to a halt. And it was clear that there was nothing else where my time effort could possibly give me that kind of return. And this is how I evaluate my time. My equation is what is my return in residual income versus how much time I have to invest. That's it. That's how I calculate where my time should be invested. I don't care if there's another vehicle that'll pay me a hundred times more upfront money. The scorecard that I live off is my residual income and nothing else. If a million dollars could fall into my lap, I wouldn't turn it away, but I would rather increase my residual income by a large amount. So let's itemize what a road trip versus the results are for me. So my first road trip, you've got airfare, you've got a rental car, you've got hotels, you've got gas, and you've got food. Those are the expenses of a road trip. If you wanna look at my math breakdown, Get the PDF or physical copy of the book. But we're going to call the road trip expenses $1,120. Now, I don't know how much profit or cash flow the Vietnamese restaurant makes. But it's safe to say that with time, dedication, and massive action, I can earn the same in residual income within a reasonable amount of time. And remember, she's still at the restaurant having to work to earn that money. But I can stop. But let's get more exact with the numbers so we can actually pinpoint it. And since my road trip may not be realistic for someone just getting started in the business, let's change the numbers and set an equation for the rest of this chapter that may be more realistic to the average sales rep. Let's say in your first 12 months in this business, you sign on average six deals a month. That is totally doable. And that also leaves wiggle room for your first couple months and the learning curve. If each deal averages $100, at the end of the year, you will have signed 72 deals, which equals $7,200 in residual income per month 
after your first year. That's $86,400 in residual income in your first year, including whatever your learning curve was. All right, so that's going to be our baseline for the rest of this chapter. In your first year, $86,400 in residual income that you no longer have to work for. Let's compare this to other investments. Stocks. The average stock dividend, because we're talking about cash flow here, the average stock dividend pays 2.5% per year. That means for every $100,000 invested, you will get a $2,500 return per year. If you had $3,500,000 invested, you'd get a return close to what you would in your first year in this business. So that's almost $3.5 million invested to get the same cash flow. Also, don't forget the average dividend pays quarterly, some even yearly. With payment processing, you get paid monthly, so we can use it now. Rental properties. The average rental property pays $200 to $400. Now that's kind of a loaded answer because nationwide, there is huge fluctuation. Let's give it the benefit of the doubt and say that each property has a $600 positive cash flow per property. So with 12 properties at $600 positive cash flow would equal $7,200 per month. So there's a rule in real estate investing. We're not going to get into real estate investing, obviously, but it's 1% of the purchase price ROI per month is considered a, an average or good real estate investment. So that would mean if we're making $600 per property, then the cost of that property using the 1% rule would be $600,000 per house. We needed 12 of them, right? So 600 grand times 12 properties equals $7,200,000. Now, if you know anything about real estate investing, you're not going to go out there and pay for that cash. You're going to leverage it. So 20% down on $7.2 million of real estate is $1,440,000. So you would need $1,440,000 in investment capital to equal the same as one year in payment processing for the same cash flow. And that's all assuming that the management of that property is built into those numbers as well. Now, to be fair, there's huge tax advantages to real estate. And it's a tool that all the wealthy use. Everyone knows that. My point here is that it's just simply not realistic for a starting point for the normal person to create the six-figure residual income quickly. Though it's an incredible vehicle after you've built capital and have financial freedom, it's just so much more realistic to build it in payment processing. Bonds. The average bond pays 6%. You would have to invest $1,450,000 for an $87,000 ROI per year. So now we know how much capital you'd have to invest to get a similar residual income from the most common investment tools. So let me ask you, is it realistic for the average low or middle income salesperson to make that much extra money to invest? Right, you're talking well over the million dollar mark of extra money laying around to invest with. I think not. This is another example why cash discounting in this industry is the greatest in America. For the cost of gas, paper, and pen, you can build the equivalent of these examples that you need millions of dollars for. For gas, paper, and a pen. It's unbelievable. This doesn't exist somewhere else. And to top it off, we get paid our residual income monthly. With paper assets such as stocks and bonds, you don't even get your money on a spendable timetable. Usually, your returns are numbers on a screen you look at while you actually continue going to your J-O-B. Right? Meanwhile, payment processing professionals see their returns in their bank account in the form of spendable money month after month where they can use it they can invest it or they can save it. They can do whatever they want with it. It's real money that they can do what they want with it now. I hope the point is made loud and clear. If you have solid work ethic and you can produce results 
and you put a couple of years in this business, you will be free and it doesn't require millions of dollars of capital cr to create that freedom. As usual, it's all just math. Chapter action steps. How much residual income do you need to be financially free? This is the amount of your total living expenses combined. This is your mortgage or rent, the food, the car, your internet, insurance, child care if you have it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's your necessity living expenses. Now play with the numbers on how much investment capital you would need working for you to cover those bills and be financially free. Play with these numbers. Play with the ROI percent that you use and have fun with this. Once you've played around with the numbers to see how much investment capital you would need to create that financial freedom, now I want you to play with the equation, but in this business. Change the amount of residuals per deal and the amount of deals per month. Do the math. How long will it take you to create financial freedom based on changing and playing around with the numbers? Instead of $100 per deal, try $125. Try $75. How many deals would you need to cover your expenses? In the end, are those numbers of what you would have to produce realistic knowing that they're based solely on you, on your results and your ability to get deals? It's your work ethic. It's your efforts. It's not a gamble if you're putting the chips on yourself. Figure out what that math is and is it realistic? If you're betting on you, is it really a bet or is it a guarantee? It truly is unbelievable when you break it down. Is this the best opportunity or what? Chapter 13, get through the suck. Being broke sucks. Being overweight sucks. Feeling trapped in a job that you don't like sucks. Missing your kid's baseball game because you have to go to work sucks. And having to ask for permission to do something that you love sucks. Requesting time off from your boss and being denied must really suck. What sucks for you? Here's the catch. Are the things that suck in your life actually permanent? Are you really stuck in those situations? Or are you choosing actions day after day and year after year that do not move you closer to your truest, most authentic, and best self? There's no question that life gets tough. Financial freedom doesn't change the fact that we don't have control over everything. From paying bills each month to our relationships, having healthy relationships, to maybe a car unexpectedly breaking, a dreaded phone call about a loved one's health condition or maybe someone passing away, God forbid. There are aspects of life that seem to be more valleys than peaks. We all have that. When I talk about the importance of having money, a sustainable income, and later a huge monthly residual, it's not an attempt to overlook life's difficulties or hardships. It just doesn't make sense to know about this vehicle and not pursue them if it's going to remove the struggle of trading time for money forever. That's all, that's all my point is. You can look at this business using a CrossFit or if you've heard of it, the Murph workout as an analogy. So the Murph workout, if you went in, you're going to hear that today's workout is going to be tough but doable. Today, you're going to run one mile followed by doing 100 pull-ups, 200 push-ups, 300 squats, and then finish with another one mile run. That's the Murph workout. Your instructor, they don't care how you get it done. Just get it done. Most people come into this business and they do a pull-up and then they take a few minute break. And then they do a sit-up and their mind starts to take over. Oh man, this is tough. I better go grab some water. Their mind wins. So they spend 10 minutes at the water cooler with the other thinkers discussing how hard this workout is. Next, they walk 0.1 miles and they're ready for a break again. Can you see the vicious cycle? The same mentality can follow you into this business if you let it. Because let's be honest, the workout is difficult enough without taking numerous unnecessary breaks. So is this business. Life and building this business can either be hard for a short amount of time or it can take a lifetime. You choose. Are you going to knock on three doors or cold call three business owners? 
pat yourself on the back and then take a break and tell yourself you did a great job? Or are you going to stop when the work is finished? People actually agree to go to school, get into debt up to their necks just to have a job where they don't make their own decisions on when, where, and how much they get compensated. They actually have to hope to get raises. Then they go out and get just enough bills in their life to always be stressed and fearful that they need their job or else ends won't meet. They willingly choose to do this with the plan that at 67 and a half years old, they can retire poor on Social Security. This is the person who never completes the workout. Never. They'll tell you, hey man, I'm at the gym. I'm trying. What's the rush? This is the individual who unconsciously wants to live in the suck their whole life with two free weeks a year so they can go on their once a year vacation if they even have the money for it. This is what society programs people for. Run away from it if your goal is to be free. Getting the workout done is not an option. Your future is non-negotiable. Get it done. You don't have to set a world record. You just have to finish. Me and Danny finished a Spartan race just like everyone else. We weren't ready, but we crossed the finish line and received the same medal as everyone else. Did it matter that we were towards the end of the line of people that finished in terms of time? Your life depends on this. You need to get it done. Stop and actually imagine this scenario for a moment. Imagine the person committed to an average life. And if they could go to Hawaii for those two weeks off that they got approval from their boss for. They're sitting on the beach enjoying the first couple of days of the trip. Dad's watching his kids play. The whole family has bigger smiles on their faces than he's seen in years. It's like a completely different family than at home. They spend the first 10 days enjoying the luau's and the Hawaiian food and culture. They're whale watching, snorkeling, surfing and all the incredible moments and activities that Hawaii has to offer. Problems still exist, of course, but they feel so small and unimportant compared to when they're at home. After all, vacations don't stop problems from existing. They just seem to dim the light that shines on them, temporarily. Suddenly it sinks in and Dad tells the family, Everybody enjoy these next couple days, because in two days we have to head home. All of a sudden... The time he is enjoying at the pool is tainted as his focus slowly is settling in on about the problems and having to get back to work when he gets home. It's small now, but he's starting to think about being back at work, the routine he doesn't love very much, and all of life's problems waiting for him when he gets home, including the finances that he will have to face after this very expensive trip. The day he heads home and arrives... The family seems stressed again. Everyone's not being as friendly and forgiving about everything as they were at the beginning of their vacation. By the time they get home, they all throw their luggage on the floor, right where it sits for four days, and they close the doors to their bedrooms to all be left alone and separate from each other. Sounds like the American dream, right? Not so much. Dad has to wake up the next day and get ready for work. In the shower, he misses the beach. He misses the smile on his kids' faces. He's already daydreaming about the next trip, that pursuit, the hunt, right? But honestly, he doesn't know when or if it's going to be possible or if he can even afford another luxury trip like that again. So he quickly releases that vision of the next trip because it actually starts bringing him stress on how much debt he is in now because of that Hawaii getaway. Was it even worth it, he wonders? Now answer me this. What would this father or mother or parent in this story do to have this experience more frequently? To see the smiling faces on all his family like that day at the beach, but at home too. How about if he could experience it twice a year? What do you think he'd do if he could experience it six times a year instead of only in Hawaii at multiple extravagant locations around the world? As I'm going through this, it honestly makes me a little sad because people live like this. It may be you listening. It's time to wake up to the reality of the vehicle that you have in front of you, for your family, for your future. This workout can take your whole life or you can pound out the reps, learn it, be coachable and get the damn thing done. 
Do you want to continue to drag out this workout? The hustle and the dedication that this business entails? Or do you want freedom within 6 to 12 months? What if it takes you 48 months? Is that worth it? Either way, it's hard. Either way, the time goes by. Do you want it to be hard forever? Or hard right now, temporarily? Remember, I asked, what would that dad do to be able to live like that fabulous vacation on a normal basis? Do you think if he knew what you knew right now, that he'd get out to work, offering the cash discount program, to relive that vacation more frequently? I hope you say yes. Everyone says yes. But can they really sustain their why power to plow through the peaks and valleys of the journey is the real question. Now realize, whether you have kids or not, you are that parent in this story. Some of you may be scared because you need the monthly or bi-monthly check from a job. Others might be like I was, young and able to say, screw a paycheck, I'm going to do this. I'm betting on myself. Short of death, I will succeed. This is the mentality that I hope that you have because this scenario, this story is all too familiar for so many people and probably most of you listening. It happens every single day. It's actually the norm of society. There are people and parents that would do anything to live the good life. And then there are those that are actually living it, such as my colleagues and myself who made the decision years ago to do whatever it takes to make this business work. The difference between them and us is time multiplied by results. The equation that makes this the greatest business in America. We have been working on our math equation while the normal world works for Friday's paycheck and getting into school debt. We don't ask for permission. We don't need permission to take time off and we don't apologize for working hard towards our dreams. We do whatever it takes. We have Y power strong enough to peak any mental mountain without quitting. We control our thoughts. We're aware of our thoughts and we don't entertain ones that go against the results we're pursuing. And my favorite, we're always on the hunt. We're always in the pursuit. I invite you to make these a part of your life and belief system as well. That's why I'm obsessed with this business. There isn't another vehicle that can make your dream life a reality in this amount of time. It doesn't exist. The outcome and success is based on you and no one else, not any outside force. If you know you are a for sure bet, then why would you do anything else? I pray that you have the vision to see ahead and believe with zero doubt that this vehicle of payment processing will get you the lifestyle, the freedom, and the success that you want. If that's you, it's already done. Are you ready to get to work? Chapter 14, six-figure residual income as quickly as possible. What I would do to rebuild a six-figure residual income from day one to day 180. So the question is, what exactly will my plan of attack be? I shared all these stories and lessons of my experiences in this industry and in life in general because I strongly believe that you're only as effective as your mind will allow you to be. Your results will only grow as much as your mind allows you to grow. You will only move in the direction that you intentionally move, not the direction that life blows you. Life will never blow you to massive financial freedom in this business. It must be intentional. Once you're conditioned with a strong mindset, identify and laser in on your intentions and apply a short of death attitude towards building a business that will allow you to own your life, now you have increased your odds of succeeding significantly. The exact answer to what I would do is simple. I would apply the five unbreakable fundamentals on a level of massive action that average people would deem unnecessary or unreasonable. From sunup to sundown and beyond, I'd be grinding. I would knock doors in every small to medium-sized town in a 500-mile radius around me. Number one, I would never stop prospecting. A 500-mile radius around where I live. Do not prejudge doors. I'd hit them all. All other aspects of my life would be put on hold 
or eliminated from my mind completely until I rebuilt my financial freedom again. Thanks to the cash discount program, six-figure residual income would be built easily within 180 days. This is true for me because of my math equation and the results that I know I'm capable of getting. I suggest that you prove your math equation to yourself. Only then will you know what a realistic timeline is and the rough numbers required to hit for you to reach financial freedom. It's going to be different for all of us. I would consciously walk into each door at a level 10 on the confidence scale and with a huge smile on my face. Number two, first impression. Do not underestimate the power of being confident in your ability to help everyone you talk to. I would work with the mindset of I'm going to help one to three people today. I would wake up every morning and the second thought in my head after saying thank you to God would be I'm going to go help one to three people today. I know I am going to help one to three people today would be the second thought in my mind and I would focus on it and believe it because I know I will. I know to get the result I want, I simply must help enough other people. That's it. Just math. Number three is being likable. If you access my video training library where I'm actually in the field pitching and show you exactly what I say, what I do, how my body language is, my tone of voice, how I use the app, you'll notice that I'm friendly, but more importantly, I'm there for business. I am in their business because I bring value in a specific area, obviously being the payment processing. Sure, I'll walk in and shoot the bull a little bit with people, but from the beginning, I am there for business and they get that. And I believe that makes me as a salesperson more likable. I do not beat around the bush while I'm there. I'm there to do business today. Today. I do not shy away from the industry that I'm in and I acknowledge the struggles that it's caused and brought to many small businesses. So I'll address it first because I'm a solution. I'm not a part of that problem. I'm a solution to it. As soon as they feel that I mean that, because I do, they love it. Being likable doesn't mean be everyone's best friend. Friends put friends off. Friends aren't allowed to push people to come to terms in a decision today. I keep friendship and being their service provider completely separate, which makes me more likable as a professional. Part of being likable is the merchant must sense that you're honest too. So separate yourself from their past experiences and they'll see that you understand how they feel. When you can tell them why they don't trust anyone in the industry because you understand why, that's going to gain trust. You're the end of the merchant sales cycle. If you watch that lesson, go find it on YouTube. Merchant sales cycle, easy pay. You're the end of that cycle if they switch to you. Never forget, people buy because they like you and they trust you. So applying all of this is going to raise their confidence in both liking and trusting you. And lastly, because I know all the rebuttals are the same and I know how to bridge to the close, I would execute my little fundamentals all taught in my trainings, flawlessly. Every pitch, without exception, I would hit on the small things because I know a professional simply executes on the fundamentals consistently, nothing more. A quote I've always loved is, focus on the small things and the big things will take care of themselves. I would apply that at every single pitch and I know the deals will take care of themselves if I do. Up to number three, of the five unbreakable fundamentals is solely based on you. I have a lot of free content and training out there that you can go out there and easily find. But no matter how much content I make, I cannot increase your willingness to put in the work. It is up to you to practice smiling while walking in. And it's up to you to have a level 10 confidence and not fake it. I cannot make you more likable and trustable. All of these three fundamentals are on you to practice and get better at via repetition and practice. Even my kids learn by age two or three. How do we get better at anything? Practice is the response they'll give. What I focus on training is the last two of the fundamentals. Overcoming common rebuttals and the smooth transition to the close. These also come from practice. 
The difference is a select few people who dive into the industry can close an elite level of deals, which is 20 plus per month consistently. I've met hundreds of people who have the work ethic, who master the first impression are in, and are incredibly likable, yet they cannot close deals in this business. And it took me years of wondering, why can't these people close the deals? The answer is they aren't good at the last two fundamentals. You must have all five. But the last two specifically are what separate the elite from the people who sign very few. It's for this reason that I have made it my main focus to show reps how to handle every rebuttal in the book. In the moment, not tomorrow. How do you get deals today? We're building our residual income now, not next year. And how to make it very comfortable for the merchant to sign up with you without feeling a hard close or awkwardness. People create an awkwardness when they close. You have to kill that. You have to do it smoothly. And I want to find the right reps to take in the field and show you how via my library. Is that you? I hope so. I want to share one last story with you. It's the last in the book. In mid-August, we arrived at the football field for my son Joey's first tackle football season. He was only six years old at the time. Now, I had always heard that sports in South Florida are serious business. Joey had been in other sports up to this point, but it was tackle football that I first experienced how much Florida meant business even at six years old. Practices are Monday through Friday for two hours a day. And don't forget, it's hot as a pistol between 6 and 8 p.m. in South Florida. Vividly, I remember the first practice, watching them full on, ball out, and thinking to myself, oh man, we're actually playing full on football here. I guess I was thinking that because they were little kids and only six years old, that it was going to be a little more watered down in terms of the physicality and fitness level required. Boy, was I wrong. As the season and every season since progressed, I'd watch fat and out of shape dads and in some cases coaches yelling at their kids, push it, go harder, give me more, don't quit, quit crying, more, more, more. Now for the most part, I don't have a problem with that kind of mentality and you may assume that I push Joey and you're right, I do. But I couldn't help but think to myself, how can you yell at your kids to do something that you clearly couldn't and wouldn't do yourself? How can you expect your child to be physically conditioned at a level of semi-pro athlete and to never quit and don't complain when you're physically the opposite of everything you're demanding? If I told one of these parents to give me five burpees, they couldn't. If there's one thing that bothers me, it's someone who can't and won't do what they're teaching others. Thankfully, by this time, Joey was used to having a father who puts in hard work physically. By the time this level of physical fitness was required of him, he'd already been watching it at home for years anyways, and it was simply his turn to put in work. To step it up for Joey, I also began taking his football practices as time for me to work out and put in work for myself. I began preparing for my Spartan races by doing laps around the football field. I'd be out there doing sprints, Burpees, push-ups, lunges, jumping jacks, pull-ups, and anything else I could put into a custom workout during this two-hour football practice. I'm literally running around the field, sweating my ass off, putting in work. As a result, Joey spends more time on the field than any other player. Every snap of offense and defense, and he never complains. In the fourth quarter, he still pushes himself 100% to the buzzer. He can't complain to me that it's hard because every time he turns his head, I'm working harder. My final lesson is be careful who you take advice from and mirror. Watch and take note if they're capable of doing what they're telling you to do. Do they have the results and the lifestyle that you want? And so on and so forth. Would you take real estate advice from someone who owns zero homes? Would you give your retirement money over to an 80-year-old man struggling to make ends meet? Would you take international travel advice from someone who had never left their home state or country? No, no, and no, you wouldn't. Yet so many people do, and it's crazy. Listen, there's many things in life I can do, and there are many things in life that I cannot do. 
Being an independent sales rep and selling a ton of cash discount deals is something I do. I love it. It's a part of me. And I coach people who want to be very good at walking out the front door and using this vehicle to absolutely change their life via financial freedom, just like it did for me. I've rebuilt this business multiple times. I live, breathe, and walk everything I've shared here with you in my book. And I invite you to take the next step in your journey and to go all in. If you want to work closer together, I'd love to talk with you about it. As mentioned, my focus is showing you how to master number four and number five of the five unbreakable fundamentals. They are what separate the elite from average or below. I have a webinar to discuss my training programs in more detail. If you're looking to get in touch, make sure that you subscribe at www.coaching.easydirectsales.com. The website, if you're looking to become an independent sales rep and work with EasyPay, where all we focus on is helping you reach financial freedom via the cash discount program, then go to www.easydirectsales.com. If you feel comfortable where you're at in the business and you would currently just like to receive the free training, then by all means subscribe anyways. It's free. There's no obligation required at all. If you're serious about doing whatever it takes and learning how to do this business, then I know the right people will find their way to the webinar and we'll be discussing the next steps of launching your cash discount business or boosting it, whichever one is applicable to you. I am truly honored that you have taken the time to read my perspective on this business and I hope it has helped you. Whether we work together via easy pay or whether you go a different route, from the bottom of my heart, I wish you well on your journey to building your business and your future. And for those of you that do make it, remember, it's who you become and what you give back to the world that matters at the end of the day. Use your financial successes and time freedom to leave the world a better place. My name is Joe Wagner, and I encourage you to live the life you dream about and dream about the life you want to live. This is the end of the audiobook and the beginning of your journey to go own your life. Go get it.